should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're coming to you live from many places around the country this morning. So thrilled to be here with you on this Monday morning. Uh, everybody's talking about the phantom week that all of us were thinking we had two weeks before Thanksgiving, but there it's there's a phantom week that does not exist. So uh, next week is Thanksgiving here in the United States and I don't know how we got there. I don't know, I don't know how that happened. I can't quite figure it out because I'm still on like March 24th. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, like I have to go back and, and go, okay, well this happened in March and this happened in April. These months have passed, Shannon. Uh, but it is a little like Groundhog Day and it does all sort of meld in together, but it isn't. We're, it's November. We, we, gotta, we gotta snap too. We gotta be with it here. We gotta be making progress, right? So Thanksgiving is next week. We are gonna have some interesting things going on this week. Good morning, Amanda. Happy birthday. Happy belated birthday. Um, so we are going to have some things going on this week because Thanksgiving is next week. And then we have a different schedule next week because it's Thanksgiving. Don't worry. We gotcha. We'll, we'll be on all the time and you'll have an opportunity. Hi, Joel. Uh, we'll, you'll have an opportunity to see some of your favorite things because we've got a, a Thanksgiving marathon that we're going to be running that's some of our favorite moments from 2020. <laughs> a year that will live in infamy literally infamy, right? Uh, good morning, Christina. So glad that you are here with us. So uh, I'm so excited to be here with you guys this morning. I, I, I miss you guys when I love having a weekend. Don't get me wrong, but I miss you guys. I miss being here with you. So we are going to be with you live for the next hour talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. We want for you to come wherever you are and whoever you are. This show, I always say our mission is to provide information and inspiration. And we talk about this show being for the larger autism community. So that starts with individuals who are on the autism spectrum. I always think of them as the beating core, the heart of our community, right? Of course. Uh, and we want to help provide that community with information and inspiration, but we also include in our community, everyone who loves those individuals. So that's an even bigger group of people. We know that together we are diverse and that we all have different opinions and thoughts and concerns and needs. It's not a one size fits all community, but there are a couple of things that we all have in common. And that is the continuing quest to make sure that individuals on the autism spectrum get their rights that they get uh, opportunity, that they have housing, jobs, uh, a, a way to love who they love, right? So uh, that's who this show is for, that entire community. And of course, that includes people like teachers and grandparents and aunts and uncles and boyfriends, girlfriends, wives, pastors, right? Everybody that loves an individual on the spectrum and those on the spectrum. That's what we're here for, to promote the best possible living situations for all of those people. So um, I hope that you'll join us. There's lots of different ways to participate. Traven's probably gonna show you here in a second, a slide. We have more and more ways that we're coming to you in this, this COVID madness, the great isolation as we're calling it, right? Um, Traven's been working hard to find more and more ways so that you can get the information that you need. We are live right now on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Periscope, as well as our homepage, autism-live.com. I know that's been broken for a little while uh, in terms of the live feature, but I think, I hope, I think it might be playing there live this morning. Uh, if not, we're, we're still working on it. But I, I also want to let you know that there is... Um, uh, 
the opportunity to watch us live, but there's also the opportunity to watch us in podcast form. So iTunes, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Ghana, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Audible, and Deezer. So all of those places, we are a free download. We hope that you will listen or watch or listen and watch. And on several of those, you, including iTunes, you have the choice. Do you want to just listen or do you want to be able to see and listen? Hey, May, good morning. How are you? So uh, we're thrilled to be able to be on all those platforms. I will tell you, if you're watching live, that first column, just um, put your comment in the the platform that you're watching. If you're watching on YouTube, you put your question on YouTube and it shows up right here for me almost in real time. Um, if you are watching in any of the places where we're podcasts, then I really want to encourage you to check out our live feature on autism-live.com. There's a chat feature there and you can go in and leave a comment at any time. So, you know, you're listening on iTunes and and you're like, this is fabulous. I'd like to interact with the show. Just head over to autism-live.com. There's a chat. You can do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Obviously, someone isn't there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But uh, I check that on a regular basis. And we include those questions, for instance, when we do like um, our special live shows with Temple Grandin or when we are live with, say, Dr. Grampiche or another expert. So feel free to write your question in there. And I know that is working. That that had had a problem, but it's working once again. We have gremlins. I don't like the gremlins, right? But we we want to be able to be here in whatever way you need us. So if there's something we're missing, if you're like, well, gee, Shannon, I just wish you were on this website. Like, what is wrong with you that you're not there? Just assume that I'm ignorant uh, <laughs> and get an email off to me so that I know where you'd like to see us. I know somebody had written it about Soundgarden and we're looking into that. But uh, so thrilled that all of you are here with us. I love that Christine is worried about me. She says that my eyes are red. Ever since COVID came, um, so I'm gonna like give you guys the lowdown on ever since COVID came, I don't know, I've had like some allergic reaction to my eye makeup and I have allergies anyway, right? So I stopped wearing eye makeup. Yes, it's true. And I started wearing my fake glasses. There's there's no lens in here. <laughs> so, so I get away with wearing less. Uh, yes, that is the truth, y'all. I do wear glasses that, you know, so I can see, but there's too much glare. So we pop the lenses out of them, but it means that I wear less eye makeup because I have terrible, terrible allergies. And I think they've just made wor been made worse by COVID because we have all these trees where I live. And used to be I was out of the office, out in the office, and I wasn't here. And we inherited a dog in all of this too, because the lovely Joanne Laura passed away, and so her. And so I'm I'm sure my body is struggling to keep up, but I'm alive and well. Thank you, Christine. I'm uh, Christina. I'm not. Uh, I'm okay. But this is the the general thing. Uh, hey, May, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you're here with us. I'm glad that I'm here and I'm glad we're here together. So that's really wonderful. Okay, you guys, uh, on Mondays, we like to start the show, first of all, with me reminding all of you that we have lots of experts that come on the show. I'm not one of them. Clearly, I'm the idiot wearing the, the no glasses, uh, <laughs> no lens glasses. And listen, I have different colors of them too. So there's a, sh a slight shade of pink to this one. There are others as well. Uh, now you know all the secrets. Aren't you glad? Uh, I don't like to hide anything. But uh, we have experts on lots of things that aren't eyeglass related, right? And we're thrilled to be able to bring them here. You know, I always like to remind you, I'm not one of the experts. I'm a, a really proud mom of an individual who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. I'm a former teacher. And I'm a former stand-up comedian. These are the credentials that you need <laughs> to sit where I'm sitting. But here's the biggest credential. I care deeply about all of you and the journey that you're on. And I want to help you to find a way to remember the joy and the humor and find the access to the things that are going to help you to get there faster. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're part of that autism community, I, I do. I have, a, I have a passion and I feel a responsibility because I've been very lucky. Um, you know, I did, I belong to that kitchen floor club that they call when, you know, you're on your, your knees on the floor and you're praying to the God of your understanding. And I remember I said, please help me to help this child. Please don't let it be my story that I mess this up 
because I didn't know what to do. Please show me what to do. And I promise if you help me to help my child that I will, I will do whatever, you know, is required of me. And I will promise to turn around and help whoever I can. So that's the deal. That's why I'm here. I want to help you to get what you need to get to. That's what, but I'm not an expert. I have an opinion. (laughs) I always have an opinion. And I've been hosting shows about autism for over a decade and interviewing experts. So, you know, I like to say it's an informed opinion. What do I know? Because I'm not an expert. So um, just remember me, not the expert, but I'll give you my opinion anytime you want it. But I uh, have lots of other experts that are here for you. Okay, so we like to start off by reminding you of that. Next, we like to do something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to give you, first of all, the actual definition, and then I make fun of it whenever possible. Uh, because there's so much to be made fun of, and life is short. And then we give you a working definition, which sometimes still needs to be made fun of. But I try to give you an example, even if it's your first day coming into autism, that helps you to begin to understand. Nobody expects you to be a Rhodes Scholar on this stuff, uh, you know, in your first eight years, right? Uh, Ever, really, unless you go to school and get the degree. But I want to be able to help you to understand, oh, why is this important to me right now? How does this help me right now? How does this save me five minutes, five dollars? How does this get us closer to where we want to be? And so I'll try to give that to you in complete jargon-free terms. But if I ever mess up, hey, Alicia, so thrilled you're here. If I ever mess up and I start, I go to the dark side and start using jargon, just, you know, give me a Yelp and say, hey, I don't know what that means. May says, love the jargon has helped me so much in my undergraduate program that I'm in for behavior analysis and uh, and analysts. I just love that. That is so funny to me because, you know, we started this so that we could understand behavior and uh, analysts. And now they're, they're using our jargon to train behavior analysts. I don't know. It's like the universe folded over on itself. It's uh, some sort of weird thing. Hey, Helen, how are you? So glad that you're here. Uh, but I love, I I love doing the jargon. It helps me to stay up on these terms. So today is an oldie, but a goodie. And, um, it's something that we talk a lot about on this show, but I'm going to put a little asterisk after it before we're done. I'm talking about ABA. Welcome to alphabet land. I literally have a song and shoe about that, but we're not that we're going to save that for another day. Uh, so alphabet land, A, B, A, what's it stand for? Let's take a look at our actual definition. There's probably not much to be made fun of there, but let's see. ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. ABA is the application of the principles of learning and motivation from behavior analysis. Don't you love it when they just rearrange the the chairs on the Titanic and be like, now you should know. ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. And so it's behavior analysis and you apply it, right? Now you're done. Uh, It employs procedures and technology derived from scientifically demonstrated principles of behavior thank you for using the same words, to increase socially significant behaviors and decrease unwanted or inappropriate behaviors. Ladies and gentlemen, is it any wonder that there are many people who look at ABA and they go, I don't think that sounds right. I don't think that I'm interested in that. I don't think I want that or need that in my life, right? When I hear people talking about inappropriate behaviors, I'm like, inappropriate to who? Oh, you want us to do socially significant? Oh, it sounds like you want me to be like you. Mm, I'm not interested, right? Uh, I should move to Austin because I like the whole thing about keep it weird, right? Odd is good. Different is where it's at. So this does not appeal to me even a little bit, right? And it's scientifically demonstrated principles of behavior doing what? Sounds boring, right? Okay. But hold the phone, because this is not the whole story. Let's move on to our working definition to see what ABA might mean. It's a proven method of increasing or teaching desired behavior and reducing unwanted behavior. Okay. Well, as a teacher, you're getting closer to peaking my interest here because I love to learn things and I love to teach things. And if there's a better way to do it, 
well, I want to know about that. Like if there's a certain amount of stuff in life that we need to teach people and there's a certain amount of stuff in life that we need to learn if we want to be able to do the things that we want to do. Now, everybody has different sets of things that they want to learn, although there's lots of crossover, right? I think we all understand and appreciate that we all have the right to communicate. That's not going to look the same for everybody. And I don't want to hear, you know, socially acceptable. Nah. We all have the right to communicate. And for some people, that means yelling. I don't like that. I really don't like it when people yell to communicate their needs. And I would rather give them an opportunity to communicate their needs without yelling. Okay. I don't know that that's you know, because society, that's my personal feeling. I guess society does feel that way too. But everybody has a right to communicate. And for some people, that means signing. For other people, that means clicking a button on an iPad. Um, for some people, it means speech and different levels of speech, right? So we want to be able to teach communication to people. And we want to be able to have them communicate to us which way works most effectively for them. So we've got to teach them enough communication so that they can communicate and that teach ourselves how to understand what they're saying. So when, I, when I'm talking about desired behavior, that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at, like right? things in that class. How does it help the person, right? Everybody's got something to learn on this planet. And then unwanted behavior, we all all of us engage in behaviors that aren't helpful to us. You know, ask yourself, what am I doing right now in my life that is not helpful to me and my goals? We all have something that's there. And I know from being a former classroom teacher that students come into the classroom and if they don't know how to do something, it doesn't feel good. You know, the kid who that I, I had a, um, a wonderful student in my seventh grade English class who was a brilliant artist, I came to find out, but he couldn't read. And so every time we would take out a book to read in class and I would have them read aloud because I think reading aloud is a great way to do learn a whole lot of things. But if you don't know how to read, like, you know, that's stress city. And he was living in fear that I was going to call on him to have him read. So he would turn his desk over. He would spit at me. He would throw things at other students so that he could get out of my classroom. And um, this is before I had a child on the autism spectrum, but I'd had some really good training as a, a, a teacher and, and had a background that, that helped me to realize it was about more than the behavior was communication. And I just needed to get to the bottom of what it was that he was communicating. So I just want to be clear when we're talking about reducing unwanted behavior, it's behavior that's stopping the individual from being able, I mean, ultimately this young man was able to say to me, I'd like to be able to read I just feel like it's too late. He was in seventh grade. And I was like, no, 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 no. It is not too late for you to learn how to read. It is not too late. Um, but it didn't need to be embarrassing for him in front of the whole class. You know what I'm saying? So as a teacher, now I like ABA. It's a proven method of teaching. And that when we teach people skills, then they don't need to use the rudimentary ones that are getting in their way that they thought were working, but really weren't. It was working for him. Upending the desk got him out of being embarrassed. It just didn't help him to be able to read, right? So ABA is considered the most effective teaching method that there is on the planet. And I know this firsthand because my son had, here's the asterisk that I was talking about, good quality ABA. I will tell you that, you know, you walk into a second grade classroom and all teachers are not the same. You know this, I know this, right? And, you know, you go into one second grade classroom and there's somebody who's doing it by the book, no passion. They're teaching, they're going to get some stuff done, but they're not really igniting students' hearts and minds, right? Um, and they don't really know what they're doing when a problem comes up, right? I liken this to poor ABA. Um, and, and poor ABA can create more problems than it solves. Good quality ABA. I called it the autism miracle in my living room. That's what I called good quality ABA, the autism miracle 
in my living room because there was a, a day and a time when I didn't know if my son could learn. And ABA taught me that my, the sky was the limit, that my kid could learn all kinds of things. So, and that he could learn them while being happy and being respected and being his whole being and not some cookie cutter on a treadmill, um, you know? So um, good quality ABA is where it's at. It is where it's at. And I love me some good quality ABA. I really hate, loathe, and despise poor schlocky ABA. We'll talk more about that. But ABA is considered the gold standard of treatment for autism. It is not the only autism intervention. And in fact, now in this wonderful new era, um, it is widely accepted to do ABA in conjunction with other things um, with your child. But ABA, when... When families are starting out and they say to me, what should I do? My child was just diagnosed with autism. The very first thing I say to them is get on a waiting list for a good quality ABA company. Boom. You know, that might take you a day or two to get on the waiting list and it might take some paperwork. Let's bang it out. Let's get on the waiting list. Let's get that done because now you're going to have to wait. And then in the waiting period, I recommend a whole bunch of things, including cleaning up the child's diet, right? And getting ducks in a row because life is going to change. When you're doing intensive ABA at the right prescription, your life is going to change for a number of years. It's kind of like having an Olympic athlete in the house where everybody changes their priorities. They shift a little bit and go, we're going to do something amazing here as a family. We're going to change what's happening. Um, not just for this individual, but for the family. And things do change. It's not easy, but it's everything. It's everything. I can, I can tell you it's absolutely everything. And one of the things that I'm still fighting for is for more and more of you to get, I love that we got insurance. Please don't get me wrong. I love, love, love that we got insurance so that more of you have access to ABA, but a lot of you are being sold a bill of goods, either with a schlocky ABA, or you're being told to do way too many hours, hours that are not scientifically proven to be effective. You really got to do this intensely. So uh, I get emotional, um, but um, good quality ABA is the reason why my son can do all the things that he can do in his life. And we are knee deep in college applications, y'all. It's just like crazy, crazy, crazy good. Uh, and when he was three, I didn't think that was possible. Every day I get to do things in my day that people told me were not possible and really good quality ABA made them possible. So this is not, you know, I love to make fun and kid and whatever, but this is serious business. So anyway, Good quality ABA, it's where it's all at. Okay, moving on. We always have a question of the day. I'll try to mop down. See, Christina, now my eyes are really red. Uh, <laughs> moving on. Uh, we have a question of the day for you. Our question is, what are you grateful for? Can you guess what I'm grateful for? I'm grateful for really good quality ABA, and I'm grateful that back in the day, the state of California paid for it for my son. Yeah, we had to fight, and we fought tooth and nail um, but we still got it and it made all the difference. I'm grateful for our health today. There are so many people who are not healthy today, more and more of our friends that are not healthy, but we're healthy. I'm grateful for all of you and I'm grateful for you guys being here. Um, oh, somebody says, uh, glad to see you. Can you suggest the best book for ABA so that parents can provide ABA at home? Um, if you want to do ABA at home, I don't want to recommend a book to you. I want to recommend two websites, but there is a book that's complementary to them. Um, we talk all the time on the show about skills, skillsforautism.com. And skills is a website that it's a, it's a, but it's a bunch of tools. Think of it as a tool chest. And um, one of the many tools that is in there is an assessment to see where the individual is at. And by the way, there's two different skills. There's one for people who are under the age of 12 and there's one for um, individuals that are 14 and up. And so, you know, I know that you're like, ah, I have a 13 year old, uh, probably depending on where they were, they would probably start them in skills living. Um, but it's the curriculum, it's an assessment tool. It helps you with a whole lot of different things, but you need to know how to do it and to know how to do it. You want to go to ibehavioraltraining.com, and, um, 
tell them that Shannon sent you get a discount. They have a lot of free things during COVID um, for lots of people, for educators and for parents, but ibehavioraltraining.com, check them out. Thank you, Traven, for putting that up there. And then our toy guide is coming out, we hope at the beginning of next week. And in the toy guide for caregivers, uh, under educational gift, I put this year, I don't have it with me, but it is the book version of what is in skills. It, it, you know, it's a, it's a tome. It's a big thing. Uh, you could use it for a doorstop. Don't, but, um, if you need, like me, sometimes I need to be able to, you know, read and page turn and dog your stuff. Um, there is the book version, which is evidence, evidence-based treatment for autism, the card method card is the center for autism and related disorders. And that is where my son got his therapy. And that curriculum that's the card method is what's in skills. So um, thank you for asking about that because I'm grateful for all of those things and I'm grateful for your question. Okay, moving on, we, because I think Bonnie is probably with us. Uh, we have a topic for the week and our topic is living in gratitude because it's important to be grateful, but we have to be living in the gratitude, you know? And I love November. November is an opportunity in a lot of different ways for me to remember to be grateful. Uh, obviously we have Thanksgiving and that's a wonderful thing, but um, it's also, you know how on Facebook you can see that there are pockets of months where there must be something to that whole astrology thing because you can see that like everybody you know has a birthday. Well, November is birthday central for me. Like, like so many people have that are important to me have birthdays in November. It's a really, really um, interesting thing. So I'm so grateful for so many of the people that I have in my life. Christina says, I'm grateful for friends that are about my son and myself to help us, uh, help support us. Um, Joel, uh, I don't know what that means, Joel. Um, I, I'm... <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, Joel. I need, you said, see, uh, something sees a sound. We're on for a date with scholarly. Uh, and then you said, uh, it was, uh, declarative, but you're subjectively welcome, Shannon. Okay. I, I thank you, but I don't, I'm not sure I understand it. You're smarter than I am. You have to explain it to me in any case. I don't know. Traven is Bonnie with us. Our guest today is Bonnie Yates, and she's a special education attorney, but I don't know if she's already with us. If she is, let's get her fired up. It sounds like she's with us. She's Bonnie. here. She's here. Oh. she's here. I'm sorry, I because sometimes I just go on and on and on and forget that you might be there waiting. Uh, so Bonnie is a special education attorney. She is an amazing person, and she just had a birthday this weekend, too. So we're oh saying- Oh my God, you are so on it. Well, Bob, I don't know this, but you share a birthday with my mother. And so oh, that, you were posting about your mom. But that's a very, you know, I believe in the whole birthday thing because um, I see I can see it clearly on Facebook. And so, um, you know, I never forget your birthday because it's the same as my mom's. And I'm so grateful to know you and to have you in my life because you have been such, I'm so grateful for you, Bonnie. You've been such a, a touchstone and somebody who has helped me in so many different ways on this journey. So deeply, deeply appreciative to you and happy birthday and happy one more year around the sun. Yeah, and I'm, thank and you. I'm glad that this year around the sun has uh, had while it's been difficult in a lot of different ways, I think you've had some opportunity to be with a very special soul on this planet who uh, makes you extra happy. Of course, I'm talking about a grandchild. You you are absolutely right about all of that. Um, I'm from Tolner Law Offices. We're an eight attorney law firm. We're based in San Jose. If you um, have a special ed issue, you should probably talk to an attorney about your problem. The advice we give on the show is general only. If you're in California, Arizona, or Nevada, you can go to our website and you can fill in the form and we will set you up with a consultation. But, you know, your question about, about what are you grateful for? 
I'm still kind of like thinking that through because I think if you had said to me when I was in like year one or two of autism triage, mm -hmm. you should be grateful. I think I might have like cold popped you. Like, how could I be grateful? But of course, from the perspective I have now, my child got treatment within a, you know, a month of diagnosis, which is amazing now to, to, to consider that. I was fortuitously steered to CARD, you know, which um, could have not happened. And, um, and, you know, my son got a shot at it. And, um, and I, I will just say that the experience of grandparenting a typically developing child has been so deep for me. Mm -hmm. I've been so affected by this 25 years of sitting with people and, 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 and being with them in their fear and their sadness about parenting a disabled child. And I, you know, I, I guess I'm just gonna be real today. For me on the best of days, it was very challenging. It was very, very hard for me. And, and I, I, I carry that with me, you know, today. So what you're all doing is really hard. And if you can find some gratitude in there, it'll just make you feel better. But if you can't, you know, it'll probably come later. It did for yeah. me. So. Um, I wanted to say that about your topic. And thank you. And I think that that's an important reminder. You know, we've talked a little bit over the years about how it appears that there are different phases on this journey for the caregivers. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm right there with you in the first two years. I think if somebody had said to me, you know, you're, there's going to come a time when you're going to be grateful for this journey that you're on. I seriously would have knocked them down. I like you saying cold cocked, um, but you know, I have to admit that um, I now with the perspective that I have, um, it's vastly different. It's vastly, vastly different. But I think that's, I think that's life in general when you, when you're able to look and, and not be in the fear anymore. Um, you know, I, when, when we first started to air, uh, there was a show that we were airing for a while that was called the A Word that followed a little boy on his trajectory through his ABA intervention. And it, it just, I loved watching it because I'd already read the book and, and, and seen the ending so I could appreciate what was mm -hmm. happening. And mm -hmm. while, while they were doing it with my son, I was too in the fear and the worry and the grief and the guilt about like, am I doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. um, but being able to watch and know the end of the story, it was just a vastly, vastly different thing. Um, but I felt for the, the mom and the dad of this little boy as he was going through it. And I frequently would call them and go, hey, saw this, you're doing a great job, it's gonna be okay, and, and it is okay. So for everybody who's out there, uh, you know, having a hard time, um, look at Bonnie, Bonnie's amazing. Um, well, Shannon, we have a really good question and I think it's it's on our topic, but I want to say first, I was listening to what you said about good ABA. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, that's um, when we get to the question, it is really important to explain to people what that, you know, what that looks like. And I remember there was another, there's a, was a mom who had a, her child go all the way through the card program. And when her daughter got sufficiently better, she threw a party okay. and she had an exhibit or a table or something. And on that table, she had like all the metrics. Uh, so she had something that showed how many drills the, the, the young lady had done in the course of her whole treatment and how many hours she had spent to get to this point. And so when we talk about good ABA, it's gotta be both good quality and it's gotta be intensity. And I would just say, I'm talking to a lot of parents that have ABA from a provider that's just doing what insurance tells them to do. They're getting nine hours a week, their kid is three, and nobody's ever sat down and talked to them about the fact that ABA has to be intensive to work because it's essentially a brain training program and you're doing reps, you're doing brain reps, and you can't get those brain muscles in shape if you're only gonna do a few reps every day. 
Yeah, so, amen to that, Bonnie. Uh, I that message. Uh, the insurance companies have done a really good job of making that so messed up that it's very hard to get through to parents. That it's about intensity, um, and you know, uh, I think we all thought in the beginning that it was crazy. I remember the first time somebody told me that my two and a half year old son should be getting 40, 40 hours a week of mm-hmm. therapy, and I. I was like, well, that's just crazy. That is just crazy. Partially because it is crazy and partially because I knew for sure that I couldn't afford it. Well, exactly. We confronted something before 2012. I'll talk about it when we answer the question, but, but, you know, it was the same as being somebody that needs a medicine and you can't afford it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the grief and the helplessness that, that that feels like is just so overwhelming. Um, but the truth of the matter is the studies are in. We know that it is not a one-size-fits-all. But for most three-year-olds who've recently been diagnosed, the, the prescription would be 40 hours a week. Um, and, I mean, I guess there are some exceptions. But for the average three-year-old who's just been diagnosed 40, 40 hours is, is pretty much the prescriptions. That's what the the studies have shown, but no one can afford that. Oprah can't afford that. And so that's why we fought so hard for insurance funding. And now the irony that insurance funding is trying to normalize that nine hours a week is enough makes me go a little bonkers. Let's get to the question. I was expecting it all along. It's just taken eight years to get here. Six to eight years. Well, you're a visionary then because I have no, I just I'm just a lawyer and I've dealt with insurance companies for my entire legal career. That's all. I thought that insurance having insurance was going to be the promised land, but you know, they're they're always remind me that when people got to the promised land, there were no curtains, there were no buildings. You still have to do the hard work. And I I guess what I wanted, Bonnie, was for people to not have to work so hard to get funding. And in some respects, if people are in the know, they don't have to work as hard for funding, but you have to work hard to be in the know. And that's why we're here at the end of the day. Let's talk for a second about what it was like in the old days. In terms of how hard you had to work to get funding, you had to bring a case against your school district and, and try to argue that their offer wasn't appropriate and it was very hard and you had to go to hearing often and people took out second mortgages on their house to pay for ADA. Yeah. It was awful. It was yeah. awful. So, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, at least now if you have an insurance company in there jerking you around, you have a basic entitlement. And I think if you are serious about getting ABA and your insurance company is giving you a problem, there are insurance professionals who will help you to get those hours. So, you know, uh, it's it's easier now. What's hard now is the proliferation of companies so that it's impossible to be knowledgeable in all of them. And then the other um issue is really you know uh the nomenclature like i've had clients say to me what's so great about aba and then when i asked them what they were doing they were basically somebody's coming in a couple times a week and giving them parent training right so right people, people need to know what they're fighting for yeah uh yes yeah and and it's something we're always trying to do here i don't i don't know why it's so hard but um but yes um, absolutely. We got a lot of people shedding a lot of love. Um, people saying we used to pay a hundred dollars an hour. Yeah. Um, out of pocket, which, you know, it's, it's crazy. And think about, so you need 40 hours of that a week. Uh, okay. That's Let's get to this. dollars a year. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. So let's, but that's just for the therapy, not everything else. Let's get to this question that someone wrote in. Uh, okay. Uh, they write They wrote in a bunch of questions and I farmed them out to different people. The, but the part that was for you, Bonnie, she's got a three-year-old who, uh, well, she's turning three next year in April. So two and a half right now. 
They're in Los Angeles. I'm so afraid about her future with this COVID that I'm at a loss. Do I have options for her? Do we need to be in the school to get any services? I have private insurance. I don't know if this helps. Does she need to be in school? I would rather focus on ABA and other surface service services, excuse me, uh, than school. And I'm so excited to have you answer this question, Bonnie. Okay. Well, one of my favorite things would be to have periodically parents come in who had either a two-year-old that was about to turn three or a three-year-old. And the reason I was excited about it was that I felt like I was one of the first people that was going to sit with them and I could make sure that they got the information that was important. So uh, first of all, you know, I would tell people that, that having a diagnosis of autism is really like having a childhood cancer and you have to intervene aggressively and you have to do whatever is necessary even if it's you know painful or hard because you don't get a second you don't get a do-over um also i would say that in california compulsory education starts at age six so you can absolutely keep the two-year-old out of school and do aba and the and the great news about having insurance coverage is you can do it you know um full time and they can they can pay for it and in you know it, it would vary from child to child but uh like with my son there was a six month period of initial skill building before he was ready to go into a school setting and he didn't start his treatment before so at four and a half he went into a private preschool with a full-time shadow and he he stayed there for a year and a half and he went to kindergarten a year late if I had a three-year-old with autism, I would so not involve myself in the fight with the public school district. And the reason why is because the public school district is going to offer you, if you're like an LAUSD, they're either going to offer you a Head Start program, which maybe would be all right, or they're going to offer you a special day class. We know from the research that if your child is high functioning enough to benefit, your child should be in a general ed preschool. And, and in Los Angeles, through COVID, you know, we had and we still have a list of preschools that would take a child with a shadow and we would put them there. Now, why is that different from using a public program? Because in many public school districts, the focus is to defeat the parent so that the parent can't make the case that the district should pick up the ABA therapy when the time comes. And so what should happen and what can happen in a good um private pre-K setting is that the people in the who are running the program, the teachers, will collaborate with the parents to get the best um, result for the child. When you are in a public school, more times than not, they are very concerned with making the case that you don't need the aid or their aid is good enough or, um, you know, anything along those lines. And so, you don't need to be fighting two battles when one of the battles you're fighting is autism. And, you know, so put off that public school stuff. Now, oh, shoot. Um, sorry. Um, why would you, what would the reason be for asking the school district to offer you FAPE? As far as I'm concerned, the only reason would be to get an offer from them that's going to be a bad offer so that you could sue them for preschool tuition reimbursement and ABA co-pays. So that might be a reason to do it if the ABA co-pays and preschool were cost prohibitive. But I have had dozens of conversations with parents where I've said to them, go do ABA for a year and a half. Don't get bogged down in this other stuff. And the feedback I got after the fact was that was the right message. Yeah. So um, what other questions were contained within her question? Did we answer them all? No, I think that you answered really well. And I, and I got to say that I also agree with you that, um, you know, back in the day when, when we were starting, we did have to go through the school district because we were fighting for funding. Um, because we didn't have insurance, but here in Los Angeles, um, there are there are two things that I can three things that I can suppose is that this this family member 
um, can come to you when it is time to go to school to negotiate what to do, which is great. So that's in your pocket. Um, here in California, we have Medi-Cal and every single child that's in California, we've, we've been told that parents, every single parent, regardless of your income, should apply for Medi-Cal, that, that you'll get denied on the first go through if your income is too high and that once you've been denied that, then you apply under disability, but that that will, if, even if you have private insurance, having Medi-Cal is going to be useful and important for you for many reasons down the road. But, um, you know, I know that through those things that, and also there is, a, there's a lot of really good ABA in Los Angeles. Yes, there's a shortage in therapists right now. Well, that was but a I, proper question. Yeah. What, what should you do about, what should you do if you don't have the kind of social opportunities that you, you want yeah. the COVID? Um, I hope it's okay if I say this on the air because it's another ABA company and I don't know if CARD's doing the same thing, but Go for CUSP, it. CUSP has, C-U-S-P, has um, been setting up, as I understand it, pods for, for families. So you can have your child, and you don't have to be getting your treatment through them, I think. You can, you can have your child get in a pod with another child and, and, and have some social interaction. And that would be very, very important. I'm really sorry I skipped the second part of the question because um, I have been thinking about how easy it has been for me during COVID because I don't have any children I'm responsible for. But the other day I was with my little grandson and it was raining and he couldn't go outside and you know he was frustrated. And I was like, this is what it's like to be a COVID parent. You know, you're stuck at home and your your kids need stuff that they're not getting. So I, I think this is going to go on for a while, you know, and I, th and, and, and I think there's a vaccine in sight. So I think it's not going to go on indefinitely. But let's just say for the next six months, if you, if you want to have social opportunities for your child, you're probably going to have to creatively, you know, um, create them um, because I don't think there is going to be a lot out there. And, and it is very hard to imagine being a parent of a child with autism in this particular time period, because I think Shannon knows this, I've told her this before, I would have a fit if a therapist canceled for one session. I was just, you know, I was trying to make sure that it all got done. So this is a really, really hard thing for parents whose children have disabilities. And even for parents whose children don't, they're suffering too. Um, but it's the same old, it's the same old, same old, you gotta, you gotta roll up your sleeves and use your smarts and figure out this stuff just the way you figured out how to help your child and get ADA in the first place. Yeah. We have a parent who's writing in from Oregon who said, how would that work with ABA telehealth and withholding kindergarten? Um, I think it, it largely depends on what age, as you mentioned in California, it's six. I don't know what the age is in Oregon that they need to be in school by, do you? No, you can look it up. Well, I don't, I'm not a professional, so I don't wanna talk about what I, what my gut reaction is to hearing the term ABA telehealth. Yeah, well, I, I, yes, I think um, the thing about ABA telehealth that they're finding um, and they're getting ready to publish a bunch of studies about it, but I will tell you, Bonnie, that, and what I've seen anecdotally from the parents that I work with is that if the parent is available and willing to be there and work as the facilitator. So what it is, is that the therapist is online in telehealth mm -hmm. and, and saying to the, the parent, okay, now I want you to mm -hmm. do this. Um, mm -hmm. that, what, that what happens then, those children, have their, they've learned exponentially and so have the parents. If the parent is not able, and let's face it, a lot of people are not able to because of work to sit there and be the facilitator. Um, and some parents are like, I'm just not good at this. And, and let's face it, everybody is not good at this. In those instances, I think it's a really uphill climb. Um, but when the, when the parent or someone in the family is able to sit there with them, we're seeing that the kids make so much more progress because not only is the kid learning, but the parent is learning too. It's hard though. 
it's hard. I don't know that I could have done it, Bonnie. I don't know that I could have done it. But for those parents, they're writing and telling us this is life changing, that they're learning more than they were from watching the therapist because they're doing. So um, yes, uh, Hassan, you can ask questions. Absolutely. Bonnie, I've got another question. Yeah, there's in. a couple up there. Go ahead. Yeah. So in my state, they are extending school break a week due to the pandemic and mandating masks. I'm all for masks, but as a general question, what should I do as an advocate to help them? So um, I'm, I'm assuming that you mean- Well, I don't know if they're in California, students? which it would be helpful if they could tell us if they are. In California, I have some stuff. I thought I shared it on the show, but maybe I just have it and I have to figure out what I did with it. There, are, there, are, there is a base for asking for a mask exemption, okay, for your child. Um, it might be worth trying to build up your child's distress tolerance and wear the mask a little bit every day before going back to school um, to protect the child, not, not so much other people. Um, yeah. So there, there, are, there are exemptions for kids that can't wear masks because of their, their disability. Um, somebody else is asking, what about, could, could you skip kindergarten and do ABA in, instead? Um, I would think by kindergarten, you'd want to have some kind of social environment for your child to practice the social skills in. But in California, kindergarten is not mandatory if you are under six. And so, yes, you could stay out. My son went to preschool between five and six. It was a good use of his time. He was behind, he needed the social, academics were not necessary yet, and he didn't have so much trouble with academics. So really until sixth in California, you can um, do whatever you want. After six, if you were to keep going and your insurance company would keep paying, all you have to do is file a private school affidavit, which is a very simple thing to do in California. If you want to homeschool your child, you go online to the California Department of Ed, you fill in a, an affidavit, it's a two page form, you say you're running a private school in your home, and that's it. They don't ask you for anything else. So you don't have to worry about um, getting in trouble with the state if you do that. It's, 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 it's perfectly permissible in theory to homeschool your child indefinitely if that's what you wanted to do when you had ABA to do it. There you go. Uh, the other person uh, said, I'm a self-advocate in West Virginia, the one who wanted to know how can I help with the masks, but I'm an advocate for everyone and want to help as much as possible. And Parker, that's You, so you have to talk to your Department of Health and your, um, your, um, your Department of Education and see what the, what the position is on masks in, in your state. I, I just have information about California. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the, the clear, um, visors. Um, and there are some that, that are like eyeglasses. I mean, they're all a little bit different and we've tried a bunch of them. Um, but I, I, the thing that's so frustrating for me about masks, um, is that, you know, for the kiddos that are learning to speak, they're not seeing the, the movement of the mouth, which is part of what we want them to see. I, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, and I, I'm a big believer in masks for health, but uh, when we're trying to learn, I love for them to be able to see as well as hear the person. So, um, but there are a lot of different interesting um, visors that are out there that people are utilizing. I, interestingly enough, the entertainment industry is really um, forging new inroads because a lot of people are back in production and on sets and they're seeing what works and what doesn't work. And I'm fascinated whenever I have an opportunity to see the camera people and what they're wearing on the set. Cause every, you know, there are huge insurance policies and everybody's being very careful on the set because they don't want to have a COVID outbreak. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of interesting paraphernalia um, that they're wearing. And, and because of the nature of what they're doing, a lot of it is clear which is fascinating. I'm even seeing masks that have a panel in them that's clear. Yeah, clear panel. Um, yeah. Well, those of us that have glasses have particular problems. But anyway, yeah. I, I have two quick things if we have time. Yes, yes. we've got um, four minutes, Bonnie. Okay, on different, on different topics. 
Um, this is from Special Ed Connection again. I just thought it was interesting. It's a topic that comes up. Gifted versus twice exceptional. What's the difference? Just because a student has an IEP for gifted education doesn't mean she's twice exceptional. The phrase twice exceptional student, sometimes abbreviated as 2E student, refers to an academically gifted student with a disability. This me means that the student meets both of the following criteria. Now here's where it gets interesting. In some states, we have IEPs for giftedness. Giftedness is a child that has an IQ that's typically two standard deviations above 100, which is average. Um, and uh, that can mean you have an IQ score of at least 130. California does not have uh, IEPs for giftedness, but apparently Florida does. So uh, if you have a giftedness designation, but you also qualify under the IDEA, um, under one of the 13 disabilities, then you also will be a student with a disability. And what I can tell you is I'm seeing a lot of kids coming through the system. Some of them have specific learning disability, but are very bright. Some of them have autism, but have very high IQs and public school gets stuck on the ability. And they think that because of the ability, there's no need on their part to deal with the disability. They don't think it's real and they don't think it has an educational impact. So 2E in California is not a recognized special education classification, but it is a real thing. And if you have a child with autism with a very high IQ, the question the, the, the questions are difficult. Some of these kids have real problems learning how to read with comprehension. A lot of these children need specialized academics because they get bored so easily, but at the same time, they may be very, very delayed socially. So you do have to teach to the weaknesses as well as the strengths. Um, so that's just a little clarification about what people mean when they say twice exceptional. Uh-oh, what happened to your sound? I'm muted. It was me. Okay. Okay. I said I appreciate that so much because uh, we hear that term a lot, but to hear it defined in that way, uh, really important. We are, are just about out of time, and I want to make sure we have enough time for you to talk about Tolner Law Offices and how people can connect to you and in which states um, they should be connecting to you. You mean I can't do my last topic that'll take you, 60 seconds? It, 60 seconds go for it okay it's it's not political it's what biden's campaign has said about education he claims this camp his his he claims his administration will increase idea funding quote to provide 40 percent of the extra cost of special education within 10 years he claims that he's going to raise funds to increase teacher salaries he says that he's against for-profit and low-performing charter schools but he supports school choice for magnet schools and high performing charters. Um, he said he will help school districts create opportunities for teachers to lead beyond the classroom. Teachers will be able to serve as mentors and coaches to other teachers and as leaders of professional learning communities and will be compensated for the additional work they take on. He said he's against arming teachers in the classroom. He will champion, champion legislation to ban assault weapons. Um, he said he will also invest in supports to address trauma in the wake of school violence. And he said he would increase funding and resources for school-based mental health professionals with the goal of doubling in size the available school-based mental health support. So that was brought to you by Tolner Law Offices. If you want to talk to us, you can um, go to our website and fill in the forms. And if you're in California, Arizona, or Nevada, you can um, follow up and have a conversation with us. If you're in one of the other uh, states, you should go to COPA, C-O-P-A-A dot net. Thank you for posting that. And they have an attorney directory and you can talk to some attorneys in your state and get some advice and hopefully some help. So, Bonnie, thank you so much and a very happy belated birthday to you. I hope you have a great week and a great year. We're great, very grateful for you. 
Uh, we'll see you back here next week. Tomorrow, we're back with a best of Temple Grandin episode. Ooh. So look forward to having you then. And then on Wednesday, Dr. Grampy Shea is here. On Thursday, we're just bringing out the recipes for all of you on special diets for Thanksgiving. And on Friday, we got Vince Redmond, licensed marriage and family therapist. It's a big week here at Autism Live. We're getting wow. ready to put out our toy guide. I feel like uh, I can just take a week off from work and watch the show. <laughs> well, next week when everybody's off, we're planning on doing a marathon of our best of 2019 all throughout the Thanksgiving weekend. So no one, no one will be without their autism live. Even You're the woman that thinks of everything, Shannon. Thank you so no, much. It's, it's all Traven. Uh, it just looks like it's me. It's all Traven. Thank you, everybody. Have a Bye, great everybody. day. Uh, give, give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. Advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Morning and welcome to Autism Live. Ask Dr. Doreen. We're so thrilled to be here with Dr. Doreen Shea. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're saying hello already to Michelle. So excited to be here. Good morning, Dr. Grampiche. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here again with you all. We're thrilled to have you here with us. And we're going to get started with questions with Dr. Grampiche in just a second. And we had such an overwhelming outpouring uh, last night. That, so I want to get right to questions. But first, I want to tell you that if you're watching us live, you're probably watching us on YouTube, on Periscope, on Twitter, or on Facebook Live. And we want to encourage you to participate in those venues by writing into whatever, you know, the chat for those are that shows up here in real time. Good morning, Kelly and Christina. We're seeing that you're here joining us. Um, if you are watching us recorded, you're probably watching us on a variety of different ways that you can get a podcast. We try to be as on as many places as we can possibly be. And I want to look at all of those places, iTunes, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Ghana, Amazon Music, which is brand new. Check it out. Um, Google Podcasts, Audible, Deezer, all of those places and more. And we encourage you to look wherever you watch your podcast because chances are that we're there. If we're not, write to us and tell us. And Traven is amazing, so he will make every attempt to get us on that venue as well. I also want to let you know that if you're watching us in podcast version and you're like, I just heard something and I want to ask a question, um, but I don't know where to ask it, the best place to go to ask the question is autism-live.com. There is a chat button at the bottom. We do not man that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but when you write into the chat, it goes into my queue for the next time that we have, uh, for instance, Dr. Grampiche here. So I got a lot of questions last night um, and I see that we've got questions that are coming in. We're saying good morning to Kelly and Missy and Christina. Uh, but Dr. Grampiche is here. She's a true expert in the field of autism. This is such a privilege. Uh, almost every week we have an opportunity for her to be here and give you her thoughts about things for this hour. And we want to thank her for donating that time. She, as I said, true expert in the field of autism, in fact, a visionary in the field of autism. So it, we're so lucky to have her here with us. But I want to remind everybody that there is no expert in this forum of any kind who could give individual specific advice. So write in your question, be as specific as possible. I also love it when you tell us like where in the world you are because that keys us into where resources might be. Uh, but I know Dr. Grampiche really loves it when you give her as much detail as possible, but know that she's gonna answer your question in a general way. 
So did I get all that about in Dr. Grampuche? That was perfect, Shannon. Yes, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to trying to give some guidance today. There we go. I'm going to try really hard because next week we won't be here live with Dr. Grampuche because of the impending holiday. So I'm going to try to get in as many questions as I can. And a lot came in overnight. So uh, let's start with a wonderful mama who wrote in. And I love that she calls her daughter my tiny human. I absolutely love that. And she was just recently diagnosed at 18 months. Uh, it's been a roller coaster. And, uh, you know, she's watching the show, Dr. Grampuche, and just adores you. And she had a couple of different questions, one that we asked Bonnie on Monday. Uh, but her question for you is about screen time, Dr. Grampuche. She plays the same screen or show over and over again. How bad is that? And how do I stop it? Do we need to stop it? She has 40 hours of ABA right now. They use the iPad and TV for reinforcements. And every time she has free time or a good behavior happens, she gets the iPad or TV. So is it okay that she's watching the same thing? Yeah, so that's a great uh, question. And it's one that has come up for a lot of parents right now, especially during the COVID uh, era. Um, you know, I, I would say this is something that uh, will be uh, corrected, I guess, as soon as you can try to do a, a full-time ABA program for her. Is it a, a girl or a boy, Shannon? I'm it's, a girl. it's a girl. And she current. I will say this. She currently has 40 hours Great. of ABA. Um, I, I, I'm going to say that it is not with a car with card, although... She has said that she's trying to get started with CARD and leave the company that she's with. Okay. So, um, and, and the baby's just 18 months, which is amazing. Um, so, you know, it's, first of all, I should say a few things. Uh, one is I would uh, love to see your little <laughs> myself, <laughs> first of all. Secondly, um, 18 months, it's really hard to do a complete well, two years. It's very, very yeah, hard. Was, diagnosed at 18 months. Sorry to interrupt you. Diagnosed at 18 months. She's uh, almost two and a half now. Okay. It's really hard to do uh, 40 hours uh, with a two-year-old because they just get so tired um, quickly. But what I would do is I would definitely uh, uh, continue to do the 40 hours and not worry about what she's doing uh, outside of that because 40 hours is a really very huge amount of, of uh, work time, let's put it that way, for a two-year-old or a two-and-a-half-year-old. And, a half year old. and if, she, if her biggest reward or reinforcer is screen time, then I would probably allow that. Um, and you always can attempt to broaden it, change it a little bit, uh, you know, like have her go on different uh whatever she's looking at different channels or different uh you know urls but i honestly am not too worried about that because the positive side is that she's working very hard and she's doing you know 40 hours of aba and i always say shannon that if you're working really hard your reinforcers need to be up there as well and if this clearly screen time is a huge reward for her and i don't want to touch that you take that away the balance of things starts to get messed up you know so the more hours the higher the reinforcer so i would leave it alone for now and i always love that you you take into consideration the individual and yeah. what is the greater good for them i always appreciate that uh while we were on the subject of screen time somebody said i have a three-year-old male child that's having a meltdown when it's taken should the screen time be removed altogether or greatly limited for a three-year-old? Yeah. So, you, you know, like I said, Shannon, this, uh, it's amazing how many parents are kind of concerned about this. And I just, I, I guess I'll say a few things. Years ago, I would have said, hey, let's really limit screen time and try to get our kids to do other things and so on. But I, um, you know, having raised three children of my own, um, screen time is, is kind of part of the game now. It's not, it's not a necessarily an unusual thing for kids of different ages to spend a lot of time online. Uh, either a lot of their social communication is online. A lot of the 
uh, you know, in, I, I remember the day when I told my kids, um, you know, before there was the internet, we used to go to the library and have to pull out an encyclopedia. And they all laughed at me because I thought they don't even know what an encyclopedia is, you know, <laughs> and um, it's Google now. So uh, <laughs> bottom line is it things have changed. So first of all, keep in mind that there's going to be more screen time for our kids than there was for us. That's rule number one. Rule number two is COVID is preventing our kids from, from doing a lot of the things they used to do, uh, going outside, playing with other kids, running around, I don't know, you know, just spending time with other kids. So obviously that's going to be filled with something else. And one of the safe things they do is screen time. So that's the second thing to consider. Now, that being said, um, there's no way I can tell you what's enough or not enough because I don't know how much other stuff your child is engaged in. What else are they doing? Obviously, it's too much if the child wakes up and gets online and is online all the way through the day. Um, and it's, uh, you know, so that's that's a given. But if you have, let's say for a three-year-old, as long as they're doing a lot of the other activities, right? Um, then like for instance, let's say um, grooming themselves in the morning or having breakfast and giving you eye contact during breakfast, during lunch, during dinner, um, doing some school activities, doing some, or there, this is just three years old. So maybe playing in the backyard, uh, building things with their uh, with their blocks, let's say, uh, communicating verbally, all these types of things, then I would say I would be fine with, let's say for a three-year-old, one morning, like mid-morning session of screen time and one mid-afternoon session of screen time, let's say for an hour each. And then, so you decide, you decide what fits in with your lifestyle and don't make the decision based on, I don't want my child to fall apart and melt, have a meltdown that put that out of your mind. Just think if my, if, don't even just think if your child didn't have a meltdown, what would you consider to be okay in terms of screen time? Every family is going to be different. So assume it's one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon. And anything above that, then it doesn't matter. You take away the screen device and it does not matter if your child has a meltdown. Um, every child is going to initially have, a, a, is going to object because you're taking away something that's very rewarding and fun and you're replacing it probably with something that's not as much fun or is a demand. So, you know, put away your iPad and I don't know, let's go do something else. And the child clearly prefers the iPad, right? So the response being a meltdown or a tantrum or whatever it is, is a normal response, right? So don't worry about that. Just don't give in and don't attend to it. So if you take away the iPad and you say, okay, now it's time for a bath or okay, it's dinner time. Um, and your child has a meltdown, pretend in your mind that the meltdown is not happening and just continue with your sequence of events. In other words, let's say it's dinner time and your child's having a meltdown. Uh, just ignore it, go sit down at dinner. I know this is hard and I know it just sounds ridiculous, but this is what you have to do. Um, sit down, have dinner with the rest of your family. When your child is quiet, then try to entice the child to come and have dinner or offer them dinner. Um, and you know what, it, it's going to be awful the first time you do it awful, probably the second time you do it, but three or four times the child will now start to, your child will start to understand that these tantrums, these meltdowns don't work anymore. They don't get me back more sc screen time. It doesn't matter how badly I tantrum or scream. They're not going to let me have the iPad except for these two times. I promise you, if you can endure it, it's a lesson that it will be very, very good. And your child will understand it within a week. So just keep, stay strong because that is the hardest thing. And I promise during that time when the child's having a meltdown, 
we go through all kinds of games in our own head. We, you know, we're like, oh my God, am I like, is this the right thing to do? Maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about. She doesn't know my child. Wow, what am I doing? I'm gonna, my child's, I'm, am I injuring my child? Am I damaging my child somehow? What should I do? Maybe I can just hold him. Maybe I can just give comfort. All of those things are just games that your head's playing with you. So don't do any of that stuff. Just go about your business as if nothing is happening. That's called extinction. That's ignoring that behavior as if it didn't happen. It'll get bad, but then eventually it'll go away. And then, and then you'll be on a two hour schedule. There you go. And just from the parent point of view, cause I know sometimes, well, we don't know what you know. So when you're talking about ignoring, we're not talking about picking the child up and dragging them to the bedroom and closing them in their bedroom to ignore them. We're talking about you're still setting the table and stepping over him while he's tantruming. And you're That's not right. talking to him saying, look, I'm stepping over you. See how I'm not paying attention to what you're doing? Which, which is so hard as a parent because you want to be like, see, I'm not paying attention to you. That's not not paying attention. So we're still in the same room with them. We're still ensuring that they're safe. I will say as a parent, before you do this, make sure that you clean surfaces off so that your Aunt Betty's favorite glass pumpkin is not sitting on the coffee table while you're doing this because... They'll, they'll look for things to get your attention, right? Um, so you kind of clear your decks a little bit, but then you do, you just step over them. And I, I used to hum to myself and start singing a little song to occupy myself, but it, this does work. This works like crazy good works. Listen to the doctor. She knows what she's talking about. Okay. Uh, we got to get questions in. So uh, by the way, both of those caregivers said, thank you very much that they appreciated that Dr. Grand Boucher. Okay. How do I get my 10 year old son to be more interested in topics that he isn't interested in? He has trouble in certain subjects in school or taking part in conversations that aren't about things that he likes. Right. Great question. Very good question. And you have to, um, you know, so I can give you two different answers to this uh, so that it's, it's really works for you. So the, the first answer, like from a behavioral perspective, as a behaviorist, uh, I could just say, Hey, give him higher rewards for the things that he doesn't want to talk about. Right. So whenever uh, w first you would have to withhold certain things that are rewards or reinforcers so that they have high value. And then when he does engage or, uh, in conversation or at school in a topic that is not of great interest to him, then you just give him more of a reward, a, a bigger reward, right? And over time, his behavior will change. Um, and definitely he will uh, our kids are smart and he will figure out that if I want the big reward, I have to talk about whatever it is, or I have to do my, uh, you know, math homework or whatever it is he's not interested in. So that's the simple version. The, the more kind of, I like to be able to think things through from the perspective of the child all the time. And so, and it helps us, I think, understand exactly what's going on and why isn't he. Because one of the things with our kids is that they do come across very egocentric, but they're not really egocentric in terms of personality. They're just very involved in their own world. Why is that? And we should talk about that because if, uh, you know, let's talk about your child and not being interested in talking about subjects that others are talking about or other certain subjects in communication, right? So let's say you go out to dinner with your friends and uh, someone starts talking about whatever, their golf game, and you start to get bored, but you're going to be polite and you're going to be willing to kind of listen and, and you know, uh, have a nice conversation and an exchange. And then you're going to switch to your conversation, your topic of interest, right? That's normally how social behavior goes. We take turns, right? Why do we do that? The reason we do that is because we can see things from the other person's perspective. We know that just like it's important to me to talk to you about, let's say my dogs, my pets, it's important for you to be able to have the opportunity to talk to me about golf, right? So 
I now need to be gracious and allow you to talk to me about whatever it is and I will be and I'll communicate with you. I won't just limit our conversation to dogs. So that is something that's missing in our kids. That's a thing they have a very hard time with is theory of mind, perspective taking. It's sort of the core of autism, which is the, the, our children have a difficult time understanding that other people uh, have different minds, different thoughts, different beliefs, different desires, different areas of interest, different whatever it is than their own. And so when they're talking about their own subject, it appears if they feel like it, sh it should be also of interest to you. They don't realize that this subject might be boring to you or you've heard enough about it. And I actually need to take turns and let you now talk about your subject of interest, right? So these are all very advanced cognitive things. And the more the uh, this is why part of the card curriculum that we've written has to do with just teaching the person to take another person's perspective. So now, depending on how uh, what your level of functioning of your child is, either and you can do both of these things. Either you are just rewarding the child when they speak about topic, you, you model, you prompt them and they communicate a little bit about, let's say golf, and now you reward that, right? And then that will gradually increase. But at the same time, I want you to try to start working on, in, on the area of perspective taking, because that whole area opens up a million different doors. Like our children learn to tell jokes. They learn that they can read other people's inferences. They can understand other people's emotions and beliefs and all that. And if you're interested in learning more about that and lessons to help your child see things from someone else's perspective, which by the way, also significantly improves their social behavior altogether, then I would recommend that you look at skillsforautism.com, www.skillsforautism.com. That's our, that's our curriculum that we wrote years over many years. And you go into the uh, one curriculum that's called cognition. And in cognition, you'll see that it is social cognition and metacognition. And there's a lot of lessons having to do with teaching the child how to experience the world uh, from other people's perspectives. And I promise you, if the child gets good at those lessons, they will really understand that they need to uh, talk about other subjects with other people and they'll be very much more flexible. There's also a flexibility section in, in another area of uh, executive functioning curriculum, which might also be helpful to your child. So hopefully Absolutely. that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to, since uh, since we brought up skills, I want to take a second to talk about what is being offered for free this week. Um, so get your pencils or pens ready, because at the end, I'm going to give you the phone number that you can call to take advantage of these free things. So skills and IBT uh, have banded together to create free things to help you on your journey. Every week, there's something free. This week, uh, for ABA parents and guardians, they are continuing to offer their free IBT parent e-learning course, Parent Tackling Autism as a Family, which is great uh, for a Thanksgiving uh, period of time. For the educators, if, you, if there are teachers that are out there that are interested, they're continuing to offer the IBT Educator e-learning module, Educator, the Social Environment. And that's available to teachers at no charge. They are also continuing to offer the RBT training course, uh, the 2.0 training course that beginning therapists take on their way to becoming a registered behavior technician. A parent can do that for free on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to call them and ask for them. So um, I, I want to encourage you, if it's a 40-hour course, it's a $440 value, you will be better prepared as a caregiver if you do that training. And then in addition to that, they're offering a, a continuing 10% discount on sk all skills products to anyone who calls and says that they heard about us on Autism Live. Just say, Shannon told me to call 
and ask for the friends and family discount. Now, here's the phone number that you need to call. Um, 877-975-4559. Again, that's 877-975-4559. And for those of you, we've got a lot of people watching internationally right now. If uh, if it's not possible for you to call that number, reach out to me by email s.penrod at autism-live.com and I will forward your email to the folks over at Skills and RBT. And while we're talking about this, Dr. Grampiche, one of the things that we didn't talk about when we were talking about screen time is that all screen time is not equal and there is an app that goes hand in hand. You can do it on its own, but you can also do it with the Skills account called Camp Discovery. And for our young learners that are learning, if, if you have any child that's trying to learn how to speak or trying to learn English, Camp Discovery is a great game. They won't know that they're having really great ABA therapy done on their iPad, um, but they'll be learning all kinds of things. Camp Discovery, all you have to do, it's free, free to the world. All you have to do is go and download the app either on Google Play or at the App Store and have your child play that. So, um, all right. Uh, having said that, again, phone number 877-975-4559. We have so many questions, but I want to, there, there is somebody who wrote in and said that they've been with CARD since April and that their child has made tremendous progress. And I hope he's still watching. They, uh, they, he was watching earlier and they wanted you to give a shout out to him. And of course, I'm not allowed to say names. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how we can do that. But if you would take just a second, Dr. Grampiche, and say hello to him because he's watching. Hello, and I'm so delighted that you're watching. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I guess we could use first name. I, I, I guess that's okay, but I don't know. I don't know if, if we can. Uh, I, I hate to endanger somebody's right to privacy. So, uh, and they said, uh, somebody said, thank you so much. Yes, si se puede. We always say that here on the show because we can. Uh, all right, I, we, we've gotten a couple of questions specifically from the UK and one that came in last night that I don't know if you got it when I emailed it to you, Dr. Grant Shea. It's really, really long. But there's a four-year-old in the UK. Um, they their native language is not English. Um, they speak another language at home, uh, but they are using broken English as much as that they as they can. He has started primary school, mm -hmm. and so they're trying to make the decision about whether it's time for him to go to school next year or not. The people at his primary school are telling her that if. It, that if he goes to school next year, that it's game over because they'll never be able to help him. But she's a little bit lost. She lists a lot of things that he can do and he's got a, light of, a lot of skills. He doesn't have a lot of behavior, but he is not really able to say a sentence yet. And she's very concerned about what she should be doing and should she be focusing on school. Okay, so I would honestly say I, um, I wouldn't worry about school too much. My, here's my feeling about school. Um, it is definitely a social environment. It's a more social environment, obviously, than being at home. Uh, first of all, this year is a very strange year. I don't know what it's like. I, the UK just shut down everything. So I don't think they're having in-person school, but you know, so at this point it's a non-question really. It's, there's no answer to this because you don't have a choice, but if you did, and if it was a matter of enrolling him, uh, in school, I would say hold back if you can just because the time that you have, and that's assuming that you're doing intensive ABA and those are the people advising you, I think. Um, I would spend another year doing more ABA. All it's, it, There's no harm being done. You can uh, begin socialization and social integration at five, at six, it doesn't matter. But you'll never really get back the available time that you have right now to teach all the things you have to teach. Um, I often will ask parents, 
what you you when you say you don't know if school is more important let me ask you is it more important if your child knows how to do addition or speak which one do you think is more important and you do know the answer to that when academics are important but they're always secondary to the basic functions that we need, like communication, being able to communicate your needs, being able to describe things that happened uh, in the past or when others are not present, uh, being able to actually describe things well, uh, being able to talk about things that you want to do or don't want to do, be able to understand other people. All the advanced language um, is always going to be more important than academics. So that is a given. Now what we're missing is social. And unfortunately, these days, because there's no actual school, you don't even have a social environment. So what I suggest is if you are in a location where it's possible, then enroll your child in some other social activities. Here in the States, we do. We have kids' gyms that are, provide a lot of social activity. There's a lot of group activities like you know games, uh, swimming, whatever, camps. There's tons of things you can do where there's access to other kids. But look at it this way. The, the higher level of, of uh, learning that your child has uh, achieved, the more successful they're going to be when they go to school. Uh, if it's a child who can speak in full sentences, who can read other people's expressions, who's kind of learned a lot of the basics, they're going to be more successful. Uh, with other kids and in school. Whereas if it's a child who has problems still with like paying attention or sitting, learning a lot of material, talking in full sentences, all of these types of things, then, and you go to school, not only are you giving up a ton of really valuable hours, but you're, you're now actually exposing the child to a, a, an environment where he might fail. And I never want my kids to go through an experience where they're not, where they start to feel they're not good enough. I'm not able to do all the things these other kids are doing. So I kind of like the idea of making my child stronger before they go into that environment. I do want to mention that this uh, parent says that they don't actually have ABA, that they're doing oh, yeah. ABA themselves with skills, uh, okay. which I'm, I'm glad to hear that they have skills and, um, I, you know, want to encourage them to take advantage of the IBT offer right now for the um, the training um, to be able to do that. And please feel free to reach out for that. I also want to say um, that I know a lot of you are writing in your questions right now. We're not going to be able to get to all of them because so many people are writing in. I don't want you to think that we're ignoring you. We're just doing the best that we can here. Uh, okay, I've got another uh, person in the UK who says, my daughter is 16, undiagnosed, and no one will help us. Um, and none, and, and she says, none, no, none school attendance. Um, so she, I, I, I take that to mean that they're not attending school. 16-year-old. Yeah. Um, and that's a slightly, because we don't talk very much about skills living on this show, and we should talk more about that. We actually should. You're absolutely right. And again, for uh, first to kind of finish up with the other parents, I do want to say that um, if you're doing skills and that's leading your program, first of all, you know, bless you, big air hug, as Shannon would say, because <laughs> that's really impressive. Um, I I would uh, get a group of people together to help. Hopefully, you've done that. I don't think I. I it's honestly. I mean, I guess it's possible. There are a lot of parents who are very, very strong parents and can do this. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm doing what is called projection, you know, and I'm projecting and saying, there's no way I could do it. I, I don't think I could do a 40 hour program myself, but what I would really suggest is that you get a team of people uh, who can help you and they can all follow the skills curriculum with you. Uh, when we do therapy, it's always a team. There's never just one person, right? So we always have one lead person who's the supervisor. And then we have, let's say three or four people who are the team, the behavior technicians. And they all, uh, they each do maybe to eight to 10 hours a week with the child so that the child is exposed to multiple people. That's important. 
because we want our kids to to generalize what they learn so that they can use it with lots of people and not just one person and it also helps not burn out all these people so especially if you're a private family doing this on your own see if you can get help from i don't know nieces nephews cousins neighbors uh people at the church uh just put together a group of volunteers and and we've done this multiple times with people i've actually one of our uh, kids who is an adult and is uh, may have just received his doctorate degree and uh, and is a international lecturer an extremely successful person uh that's how he did that's how what his mom did his mom gathered a whole bunch of people from their town and they all provided therapy and we helped with the supervision so kudos to you get help i don't want you to burn out and i do want your child if they're staying out of school to really be packed with aba because you really yeah. want to have benefit from that and the, the skills living program that we were talking about yes. is designed specifically for uh individuals who are older and, right. and it's it's so much more uh comprehensive because there there are so many different things and no one would use everything that's in it um so you pick and choose what you would use but it's it's really good now somebody has written in and said can i post a link for the ibt training I'm not able to do that because what it is is a bunch of modules. So you have to be set up with a license for the modules so that you can do it. So it does require that you call that phone number, which is 877-975-4559, or you email me at s.penrod at autism-live.com and I'll connect you. But I want to give that parent a hug because they said, my son has zero services and we are struggling. I need to take matters into my own hands. In Connecticut, there are no service providers who will take our state insurance and keep denying us because I'm a master social worker student and not working because I'm a stay-at-home mom. So I really want to encourage you that IBT, RBT um, training will help you immensely to be able to help your child. And then, you know, should you decide that while you're being a student that you want to work, um, you know, everybody's looking for RBTs to hire. Are they not, Dr. Graham Oh, my like gosh. That. Yeah, There's absolutely. such a need right now. Yeah. Huge need, huge need and very valuable credential. And I don't want to uh, forget to answer the question of the parent of the 16-year-old. I do want to address that real quickly. Yeah. It's basically, yeah. it's the same situation wherever you are. If you're in you know, Connecticut or if you're in England, it doesn't really matter. Um, this is many, many years ago. The reason that we built out skills and IBT as two separate uh, companies, the reason we did that was for parents who don't otherwise have access to ABA providers. So essentially... Uh, and I'll quickly go through sort of uh, uh, the process and what it is. Um, so basically what you do is you first go on, um, well, you could go e either one. IBT is, a, uh, is an online portal of, of ABA procedures and protocols. So it's all the, how do we do this? How do I do a discrete trial? How do I do random rotation? How do I do shaping and chaining and differential reinforcement? All these fancy ABA methods, that's in IBT. So if you go into IBT, Institute for Behavioral Training, and it's ibehavioraltraining.com, you go on there, what you'll see is a whole series of short trainings it starts with and they're wonderful wonderful quality trainings starting with what is autism and you know what is aba and how do i take aba and administer it to my child how do i handle a tantrum how do i uh teach using this creature and you name it there's lots and lots of modules you can select from and there's even packages that will actually get you through uh, to the point of what, let's say, an RBT does. RBT, by the way, stands for Registered Behavior Technician. There's another credential also called Board Certified Autism Technician. These are the two certificates that you receive after you've completed 40 hours of class time through IBT or through any other agency. 
and you've taken a national exam that uh, certifies you and says you understand now the basics of, of what uh, ABA is. But these are just the procedures and with, with, you don't need the credential necessarily as a parent. It does help you. It's a deeper level of understanding. So if you have the time, I highly recommend either one of those two credentials. And again, you can get them on IBT. Now that aside, you basically need to know the how to, but you also need to know exactly what your child needs. What are your child's specific needs? And every child is different. As you can see, lots of questions that we're getting. It's a two-year-old high functioning, four-year-old with severe delays, 16-year-old. This is all, autism is a huge spectrum, right? So what you should do then is you need to assess your child. You need to figure out what are my child's needs? And again, for that 16 year old who's undiagnosed, I assume that this is a high functioning individual, which is why they're not diagnosed. Don't worry, don't get hung up on the diagnosis. This is all about figuring out what does the individual need help with and how do we teach them? So basically you will now start with the assessment. You'll go to skillsforautism.com, right? Skillsforautism.com. On there, there, you start with an assessment and you answer questions about your child. And I, I, you know, it'll be a lot of questions. If you're an older individual, if, you're, if your child is 16, you'll go, is it, is it the same website, Shannon, or is it a... It is, and, and I actually think it's, it's slightly better if they'll call, they call the phone number because they'll get the discount yes. and then they'll hook them up with the right one. Yes, uh, but it is the same website. It's just a matter of I think it's very easy to go into the wrong one off the website. So I advocate the phone number, which is again eight seven seven nine seven five four five five nine. And you say that you saw it on Autism Live. Yes, and so because there are two skills there that we built. First, we built the regular skills, which right now I think is called skills developing. Um, and then later we realized that there are so many skills for our children who have now aged a little bit and they're above the age of, of like 10. And so then we built uh, skills living, which is um, for older individuals. And that goes all the way through adulthood. And there are different skills, right? Like a two-year-old or a five-year-old, I might teach them play. But for a 15 year old, I might be focused more on dating, you know, so it, it's very different. So, uh, would, but both of them start with an assessment, which are a series of questions. Can your child do this or do that? Can this individual play appropriately with peers? Can this individual, uh, you know, go out to a restaurant with a date? Like whatever it is, the question, and you say yes or no. If you say no, then if you say yes, great, it'll, it'll track it, but it's just in the, in the group of lessons that are already mastered. If you say no, it'll go into kind of this area of, okay, these are all the things we now need to work on. And you end up with hundreds and hundreds of lessons that are, are to be taught now. And they're in different areas. Like for instance, for skills, uh, for children, the areas are language and social and cognitive and executive functions and play and academic, I mean, all these different areas. And so you end up with a series of lessons within each of these areas. And now it's a matter of how much time do you have to, to use those techniques that you learned in IBT? How many hours a day are you going to use those techniques with this content? So skills gives you the content, IBT gives you the process, the how to, the protocols. And together, if you know how to, and now you have like a whole list of content that your child needs in order to get closer to their own age level, then you just start teaching. So, and, and skills puts it in the right order for you. So you'll never teach something advanced when a prerequisite skill has not been taught yet. And skills gives you great, great detail for the viewers who are already on skills. You know that you get a massive amount of detail 
Uh, it'll help you with IEP goals. It'll give you teacher goals. It'll give you all kinds of stuff that you need. So I highly recommend it for all of our parents who are watching who need access to ABA. This is the way to do it. Wonderful. And I, don't, you guys are writing in a bunch of questions. I want to remind you that what we, what a, there were a bunch of things that were free on IBT and skills weekly. Um, this week, it because somebody asked because they missed it. Um, parent tackling autism as a family is that module is free on um, skill. On, excuse me, on IBT this week. Um, and the RBT 2.0 training, which is that it's many modules, it's 40 hours of training, and uh, it's like a $440 value. That is free on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to call and tell them that you're a parent and that you want to do it. What they want to hear is that you're going to commit to do the whole thing. Um, they, they like to give it to people who can use it during COVID. Um, and so the number again to call for that is 877-975-4555. And somebody said, can we get access to the modules even if we're using another ABA company for therapy? And the answer is yes, um, because that is the right answer. So um, of course you can. Please take the knowledge and use it in the way that will help you to help yourself or to help um, you help your child. And I love that they that they are committed to that. Um, okay, I want to get to a question. My little gets mad at the dog when it takes his toy and chews it up. My son bites the dog hard, so hard that the dog yelps. How can I help my son express himself and not bite the dog? Um, and he is four years old. I don't know if I mentioned that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's an easy intervention, but it involves you being present or someone being present whenever the child has access to the dog or vice versa. Uh, because basically, you know, what you cannot do is turn away, let the dog take the dog, take the child's, your child's uh, toy, chew it up. And then you try to either punish the dog or your child now has the opportunity to punish the dog. I mean, what he's doing is he's punishing the dog, basically. So what you need to do is, uh, first of all, try to prevent it from happening. And I know it's a, obviously that's a obvious answer and it's hard, right? But uh, where if your dog actually, first you try to avoid it because obviously it's not fair to the child. The dog is coming and taking away his toys, right? So that's your number one thing. Secondly, if that doesn't happen and the, the dog actually gets access to the toy, then basically you have to be there at that time to make sure that you prevent your child from biting the dog and you give him the words that you would use to punish the dog. And I don't know how your, uh, you know, every family is a little bit different in terms of how they try to uh, manage the behavior of their pets. So assume that maybe you are a family that would use a, a newspaper rolled up to uh, smack the, the nose of the dog, which is like a typical way that uh, we're taught to, to manage our pets, uh, then you teach your child to do that. And you teach your child, you model for your child the appropriate behavior that would replace the biting, um, whatever that appropriate behavior might be. Model it a few times, reward the child, get him another toy. Um, and you know, just make sure though that you are able to replace that chewed toy because Here's the thing, when you when the dog chews the toy, your child has lost a reinforcer, right? Immediately. Now you're trying to teach him something new. You better have a, a reinforcer that you can offer, which is just as powerful. Otherwise, he's just not gonna learn because you know he's he's somebody just took away his reinforcer and it wasn't replaced. So make sure you have the ability to give him a, a new toy of equal value for actually doing the right thing and for actually, uh, mo you know, telling the dog not to do it again. Great. Um, uh, I, I so appreciate that. And so somebody has written in and said, if we go to RBT 2.0, 
will it tell us what we need to do? Let me read exactly what they said. Will it tell us what we need to do if we want to continue to get the credential so that we can pursue it as a career? Um, and yeah. and what I what I love is that somebody else posted for that parent a link to the BACB dot com, which tells you what the requirements are for the RBT. So that yeah, <laughs> a parent you, took care of that for us. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely uh, can. I mean, so the way that it works is that you can basically uh, get your basic training, which is less than the RBT. Uh, then you can go ahead and extend that basic training and get your actual RBT. And then you can apply to a lot of places for a job. Now, here's what's very cool. IBT, the organization that we're talking about, uh, Institutes for Behavioral Training, they actually will also help get you a job if you're interested. So what they do now is they will give you the training and that and the training will be uh, kind of free to you if you go and work for an organization that's partnering with them. They have a lot of partnering organizations, including CARD. So uh, wherever you are, you should get on the phone with someone at an IBT and say, I'm kind of interested in doing the RBT. And they will tell you if they have a vacant spot in your area with any organization. And that way you can actually train with them, take your exam and go straight and you'll have a job. And, and again, that phone number is 877-975-4559. And here's an extra added plus um, because there, there are other places that you can do the RBT. Um, but what I love about at IBT is that when there, cause there's another distinction too, besides an RBT, a registered behavior technician, there's one that's a, a board certified autism technician and some companies need that designation. Um, but when you do the RBT 2.0, you're doing the requirements, the online requirement for both of them at the same time. And a lot of them, you can't say that. Um, so I'm a big fan of it for that reason as well. Okay. I want to shift to my son is seven and diagnosed with high functioning autism, ADHD, and anxiety. He has trouble regulating his emotions and relating to others. What do you recommend? Should, and they're saying, should I find a local card office? Oh, it's so hard when you have kind of the combination of those three and it is more and more common, I will say. Um, yeah, well, you could do, you don't necessarily need to find a card office. That would be great if we are in your area, clearly we can help, but you can, you should probably start with an assessment. I feel like using the skills assessment to kind of identify exactly what's going on with your child and what their needs are is your first step. Um, and you know, so there's different, let's talk about each of those things. Uh, with autism, you are going to be lacking and it's high functioning autism. So your, your child's going to be behind on advanced skills. And those are things like cognition, you know, that thing that I was talking about in regards to being able to take other people's perspective, uh, understanding other people's desires and beliefs and goals and all that. Um, and you're also going to have some issues with executive functions. So problem solving, planning, those types of things. And you're probably also going to have some deficits in the social area. So just social communication. Uh, being able to go back and forth and interact with peers and know how to behave in different social environments, all of those areas. So once you do the skills uh, assessment for your child, you will get a load of lessons within those areas and anything else he might be missing, by the way. So, you know, whether it's language or academic or, or fine motor, gross motor, it doesn't matter. It's all there. So you'll have the ability to have kind of a list of lessons at least, and, and that will help with uh, all the issues that could possibly be resulting from the autism diagnosis. Now, the ADHD diagnosis would lead to hyperactivity perhaps. I don't know which type of um, ADHD, if it's a hyperactive type or inattentive type or a combined, 
there's three types of ADHD. Uh, assuming that there's hyperactivity, I promise you that when you get into an ABA program, it'll help because it really structures and regulates your child's environment. Um, it, but if it's an excessive amount of hyperactivity, you will need to see a physician, a psychiatrist, or a developmental pediatrician who will be able to uh, help you with medical help as well. With ADHD, if it's very severe, the inattentive type of ADHD, a lot of the ABA lessons will really help. But severe hyperactivity, and I have seen children with severe hyperactivity, it's extremely hard for them to sit for a minute to learn. Um, they are just fleeting all the time, running back and forth, and it's really hard for them to focus. And medication does help with that. So, and there's very good medications now for that. So I would, uh, for the ADHD portion, your, your way to go is not just ABA, but perhaps seeking out medical help as well, uh, so that there's a combination of you know, there's a, a medication like Adderall or Ritalin or even more advanced ones where your child is calming down enough and now the ABA is effective and is helping teach. For the anxiety, you'll need a combination of what's called cognitive behavior therapy and perhaps medication. It depends on the level of anxiety. By the way, the issue that you'll have is that some of the medications for ADHD actually make anxiety worse. So you sort of need to see a psychiatrist who's going to really work with you, really understand your child's issues, and then also help you interact with an ABA organization so that you can get the ongoing ABA, but also some help with medications that will help your child calm down a little bit and perhaps pay better attention and not be as anxious. Medications for anxiety are antidepressants. They work for anxiety. And so you, you really would need to consult with a psychiatrist and as well as get him involved with a, um, an autism ABA program. And can I, because we, we've had many questions that I haven't gotten to yet about um, biomedical, but especially for people whose kids are um, exhibiting ADHD, there's a large growing school of thought about making sure that you reduce the level of pesticides in their diet. Um, just want to throw that out there that- well, You know, and I'm glad you said that, Shannon, because we do see a lot of hyperactivity in kids, which is, is suddenly improved when diet has changed. It's, it's not, you know, pesticides, but also food coloring, sugar, yeah. of course, uh, anything that you're allergic to, all of those types of things can make uh, hyperactivity increase. There we go. Uh, and perhaps soon we'll talk more about that. But this is probably our last question. Hello, beautiful ladies. Dr. Doreen, what's, what, what's good one-on-one -on -one therapy for comprehension in California? ABA. I mean, there's, there's no question. So with ABA, you are really learning comprehension of, of different things. There's, you know, there's everything from reading comprehension to listening comprehension to, and, and it starts at a basic uh, level and it goes to very, very advanced. So I, if you find a good ABA program like CARD, uh, you'll definitely do a lot of work on comprehension. And, and I happen to know that this is a card parent. And okay. so if they, a good friend of ours, and I, and I just want to say, if you would like help knowing which lessons to go back and during your caregiver collaboration to talk about, let us know, because we can help you to know what to ask for. Um, so anyway, I, I, we're, we're just about out of time here, but many more. First of all, I want to say hello to the folks from Pakistan who have written in. Um, and we've got folks from France watching as well. So I just wanted to shout out to everybody that's there. And I love how you guys are talking on Facebook about how to get a BCAT, how to get an RBT and the difference between the two. I love it when you guys talk to each other. But I especially love um, Amanda, who is a big fan of skills and RBT, says um, that she was offered a job in Miami before she moved. I absolutely love that. 
So I want to thank everybody for, my clocks are saying two different times, but yes, we are out of time. So I want to thank, first of all, Dr. Grampiche for being here. And, and what a thrill it was. This was fast moving. We did not get to all the questions, but we got to most of them. We won't have you back here live next week. So I just wanted to say how grateful I am for you. Oh, thank you. And I am for you, Shannon. I love you very much. And I love you very much. And I love all of our viewers and all these amazing people who show up to help their kids and kids around the world. So uh, thank you so much and happy Thanksgiving to Dr. Grant Pichet. Thank we you, are, everyone. Have a speaking, great day. Thank you. Speaking of Thanksgiving, we're back tomorrow. Tomorrow is the very special recipe show. We're just doing Thanksgiving recipes here, um, especially for those of you who may or may not be on a restricted diet. Like, you know, how do you make the gluten-free, casein-free pumpkin pie? we're taking it all apart. We've been doing this for years and we've, we've found some good recipes. So uh, we're also going to make the recipes available on our Facebook page. I don't know how to do that on YouTube. So um, tune in tomorrow for that. And don't forget on Friday, we're here with Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy and licensed marriage and family therapist Vince Redmond is going to be here to talk about all the stress, <laughs> you know, and how do we reduce that. But anyway, uh, and more of your questions and news on Friday. We're out of time, but until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're coming to you live from Southern California, different places in Southern California this morning. So thrilled to be here with you. We're just T minus one week from Thanksgiving here in the United States. And I'm particularly excited about Thanksgiving this year. I don't, I, I know there's a whole lot of people who have a whole lot of angst about this and I'm coming from a different place. I think we all need a little bit of a change up, change of scenery, change of diet, change of whatever. And I'm gonna be proposing different ways that you can connect with your family socially distanced uh, and great ways to have great food, even if you are on whatever diet you're on. Uh, good morning, May, so thrilled to have you here with us. So this is our, our Thanksgiving recipe show. Uh, we're gonna start out and do our jargon of the day first, but it is our Thanksgiving recipe show. And I'm very excited about that because I can talk about food forever. And I get really excited about talking about food and good food. And um, so that's today. And you will see I'm a foodie. And so I get super, super duper excited about that. And over the years, we've had a lot of guests who come on and talk to us about a lot of different foods. And we've taken... Over the years, we I've done some different blogs on different sites, and um, we put out on Facebook already this morning some of the recipes that we're talking about, uh, links to the different blog posts that I've done. Some of them are like really old links, and you just have to scroll down till you get to the recipe. I tell a whole big long, you know me, long-winded story, right? <laughs> then you get to the recipe, uh, but we're going to go over them here too. Good morning, Nasser. So thrilled to have you here with us. Uh, I, I, May, you get excited too. I mean, uh, listen, I like to talk about the food. Yes, I like to eat it too, obviously, but uh, I think I enjoy more talking about it than anything else. Let's be honest. I mean, that's that's the thing. So, uh, so thrilled that you guys are here. There's lots of different ways that you can connect. Hi, Nod. So thrilled to have you here. Lots of different ways that you can connect and for me to give a shout out and say welcome to the show. Uh, there are so many different ways to watch us live this morning. Right now we're live on YouTube, on, uh, Periscope, on Twitter and on Facebook live. And we're also live on our homepage too, but I'm going to talk about that in a second. If you're watching on those big four, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or Periscope, all you have to do is write in your question right on that format. And it shows up here. It aggregates and shows up here on my screen. And that's a really exciting thing. Uh, hola to Alicia. We're so thrilled to have you here. Um, and if you're watching us recorded, like you're catching this later on in the day or three years from now or whenever you decide to, to watch this, uh, there are lots of different ways that you can watch our podcast. We are a free download on iTunes, we're on Google Play, we're on everything. I mean, the list is there, Deezer, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Hey, if you haven't checked out Amazon Music, because uh, that's pretty brand new, along with Google Podcasts, we're on Audible, we're on Deezer. And I, I bet you that we're wherever you get your podcasts. If you go to that place that you get your podcasts and we're not there, would you do me a favor and please let us know? Because we'd like to be there. 
Um, so we love to hear from you guys and hear where you like to catch your podcast and where it's available. Like for instance, on iTunes, you have a choice. You can download us just, uh, sound and take us on your hike or in your car, or you could download sound and picture and watch us just like you do on YouTube. So that's entirely up to you. And again, that is a free download and we're thrilled to be able, um, for, to be on all of those different places. Cause we want to connect with you. So here's the deal though. We want to connect with more people. We think that, you know, this, our whole mission here is to provide, uh, individuals in the autism community, uh, with information and inspiration. And when I say autism community, I'm talking about everyone. I'm talking about, of course, individuals who are on the autism spectrum. They are the beating living heart of that community, right? But we include in that community, everyone who loves them, everyone who wants to help to make a difference for them, everyone who wants to support them, give them wings so that they can fly on their own and pursue the things that they want to pursue, have the job that they want, have the romantic partner that they want, be able to dress the way they want to, to be able to have the, the support to request and receive the things that they need in life. So I think there's a lot of us in that community. I count myself part of that community because I have a son who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. And, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm like all of you. I want, I want for him to be able to realize all of his dreams and I want to be helpful and be an ally and support him in that and not slow him down, not get in his way. Right. So if you're a teacher, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a spouse, and you're like, listen, I love this person and I want to help them. We welcome you here to this community. We want to help you to achieve that dream with them. So that's why we're here. And we want to get to more of those people. We do not spend money on marketing. It's just something you need to know about us. If, if you're ever watching a commercial for Autism Live, it's because someone else made it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And put it someplace or paid for it for us because we don't do that. So we count on you. Word of mouth, tell a friend, uh, like us, uh, write a review about us on iTunes. That helps other people to know that we're here. Uh, I, I, it's always one of those tragic but wonderful things when somebody finds us here and, and they'll say, oh my gosh, I didn't know that this existed. Did this just start? Well, we are, we are about to celebrate having been on the year air for 10 years. So, you know, <laughs> it's word of mouth. So help us. If you like what you find here, tell the world about it or just like us or subscribe or whatever. You know, um, it is the way that other people find us. When, when we have more subscribers than other people hear about it and go, oh, well, here's this thing that so many people subscribe to. Um, it puts us in places that um, more people might find us. So uh, we ask you to help and support and like and all those, whatever works for you. But a review on iTunes is a really good thing. You know, <laughs> no pressure, but if you really want to be helpful, a review on iTunes, really good, helps more people to find it. Okay. Uh, I always like to remind you whenever I have a couple of minutes at the start of the show that we have lots of experts on the show. We're not having any experts on the show today, including me. I'm not an expert, but I get excited and I want to help you to realize all of your dreams. So, but don't mistake me for an expert. That's all I ask. I'm somebody who cares passionately and wants to help you, but um, you have to understand that I have opinions. I like to say that they're informed opinions, but I guess the jury's out on that as well. Um, but please don't mistake me for an expert, okay? If, if, we, can, if we can go with that baseline, um, then we will be just great. Okay, so uh, we always start with the jargon of the day. And uh, that's something that we want to do today. Jargon of the day is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. And first we give you the actual definition, and then we make fun of that whenever possible. Then we uh, give you a working definition, which sometimes makes the experts break out into hives. That's just a bonus. But uh, we want to give you a place where you can begin to understand what it is we're talking about. So uh, Traven has just informed me that the jargon of the day today, because we decide these things much in advance, is ASD. ASD. And this is something that we will hear a lot. Um, so uh, let's take a look at what our actual definition for ASD is. I got screens popping up of all kinds of things. ASD, Autism 
spectrum disorder is a developmental disorder that affects communication and behavior. Although autism can be diagnosed at any age, it is said to be a developmental disorder because symptoms generally appear in the first two years. And that quote is coming to us from the National Institute of Mental Health. And Traven um, updated it for us. And, and I think that this is a much better definition. I will tell you that one of the issues in the autism community is um, that because this is the only way we have of defining autism, I hope that we get to a point, and this is my hope for the next five years, that we get to a point where we can talk about autism spectrum disorder, but autism spectrum without the disorder. Because I know many people who are on the autism spectrum who I would not qualify as having a disorder. I know many who, uh, that I would, um, but there, I do believe that there is a point that some people achieve where, you know, they're able to do more than I'm able to do. And no one has uh, diagnosed me with a disorder. Do you see what I'm saying? And so I hope that we will get words uh, that will help us to di differentiate between when it is someone who has autism spectrum and needs support um, and someone who has autism spectrum and is living a full, rich and wonderful life and cannot be categorized as someone who has a disorder. Um, I you know, I'm really looking forward to that. So this is our actual definition. Let's take a look at what our working definition is. Uh, so ASD now is the umbrella that includes a bunch of things that used to have their own definition. So it used to be that you could have autism, you could have, someone could be diagnosed with PDD NOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder, uh, not otherwise specified. Um, or they could be diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Now it all is under that same umbrella that's ASD. And there's a different criteria now that it's not even considered new because heavens, it's been around for more than five years. Um, but, um, you know, all of these things now go under one umbrella. We, we thought when it all, all went under one umbrella, we had fear, like were people who were previously diagnosed with Asperger's, were they not gonna have access to services? I really appreciated that Dr. Grampuche was leading the charge saying, no, I think they'll actually get more services. That ended up being true, that more people on the autism spectrum that were in that Asperger category got the help and support that they needed. And, I, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, I think a lot of us were really hopeful that now that since it was all under one umbrella, it was gonna be harder for pediatricians to skinny out of it and go, Mm, you know, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, but I don't think it's a duck. And they would give that PDD NOS, um, you know, like you just, you know, you got a lot of things going on and you could really use some help, but not enough. It was so tragic for a lot of parents back in the, the 90s and the early aughts that they they couldn't get the autism diagnosis, so they couldn't get the help and support. I think we're still seeing it now because people will say, oh, well, I think it's, uh, oppositional disorder or um, sensory processing disorder, right? These other diagnoses that don't qualify you for the help and the support um, that the kiddo needs, right? Because no insurance is providing ABA therapy for sensory processing disorder. They should, but they're not. Um, so, um, you know, we, we live, we learn, we move the dial a little bit, but we need to know that ASD now includes that umbrella. It's all under one umbrella. All these things that were once had other uh, definitions. So thank you, Traven, for updating our jargon for us. Okay, moving on. We always have a question of the day for you guys. So our question today is, who are you grateful for? Isn't this a great question? I will tell you, I'm so grateful for my husband and my son. Oh my goodness. Yesterday I came across uh, years ago for my birthday. I don't know if you guys remember, they used to have these booths at the mall that were called talking heads. And they basically, it was a green screen and you put your head on top of this cutout thing and they would project on the green screen, a music video. So it would be your head, but dancing bodies. 
and they had, uh, they, my son was probably eight and my husband took him to the mall and made this video for me, best birthday present ever. And I came across it the other day in my memory feed and I must've watched it a hundred times yesterday. It made me so happy and just filled my heart with so much joy. They're both crazy and I love them. And I'm so, I don't know what I would have done in this COVID madness. Like, cause we have not left the house. We don't, I have not been in a grocery store since like November or excuse me, March 2nd. Uh, I, you know, we've seen friends from across the parking lot, but not within 20 feet of a friend. Uh, we've really taken the social distancing very seriously at our house. And I would have lost my cookies, lost my marbles, lost the whole kit and caboodle if it hadn't been for these two crazy individuals that I'm living with. And I, but I got to say this, I'm really grateful for you guys having the ability to be here with you guys and, and share things with you has really helped me. If I'm not one of those people who could have been out of work during this, I, I just couldn't have handled it. And knowing every day that I get to come in here and have time with you guys, you know, don't get me wrong. I need a break too. I'm really looking forward to Thanksgiving and having a couple of days off and not thinking constantly about the show, but Honestly, I will be so ready to be back here the Monday after Thanksgiving and be like so grateful to be back here with you guys. Thank you. Amanda, I'm grateful for you too. I honestly, I'm so grateful for all of you, your touchstones for me. It's really, really important. And before I forget, since I'm talking about having a couple of days off, I want you to know Autism Live is not taking any days off. We have a marathon ready for you over the Thanksgiving holiday that'll start next Wednesday and go through the whole weekend, some of our best moments from the year. So if you're missing us, you won't need to you just turn it on and there will be the Thanksgiving marathon, uh, which is all Traven. I'm so grateful for Traven. Oh my gosh, I couldn't have gotten through this year without Traven. So I'm grateful for absolutely all of you. But what are you grateful for? Let us know. Uh, all right, we always have a topic of the week and our topic this week, uh, I love that somebody wrote yesterday and asked what, what the topic was for the week. Um, but our topic is living in gratitude. You know, we all have a choice today that when we swung our feet over the side of the bed, we have the choice about can you, we can either be in gratitude or we can be in want. And uh, I was talking with another group this week about, you know, that Norman Rockwell paint painting of, it's the iconic Thanksgiving painting. And I always thought it was the Thanksgiving painting. Do you know what the title of that painting is? The real title is Freedom from Want. And that just kind of like took the air out of my lungs when I heard Freedom from Want. And, you know, the thing about gratitude is I think we all have things that we want and things that we desire and things that we wish were different, right? But when we are in a moment of gratitude, it, it fills that up and it fills that bucket just like at least a little, if not all the way to the top. When I remember the things that I'm grateful for, that I'm grateful for my kiddo and I'm grateful for my husband, um, other stuff just doesn't matter as much. You know what I'm saying? So it's a choice. We all have a choice. You know, the inner machinations of our head are our own. We teach this when we're teaching our kiddos about autism and perspective taking and your brain is your brain. My brain is my brain. And it's all, it's an inside job, as they say. And you get to choose what the conversation is in your head today. And believe me, there's enough to be crazy about. There's enough to be depressed about. There's enough to be fearful about. And we can choose all of those things. And they're there and they're available. And I will not judge you because there's a lot going on right now, right? But we also have the choice to be in gratitude, to make the list of, okay, what am I grateful for? I used to do this breathing exercise in the morning where you, you look at your hand and you, uh, you know, you, you take one hand and you press your thumb and you take an inhale and an exhale, and then you touch the next finger and take an inhale and an exhale. And you do this a couple of different times to center your breath. And then you move to a gratitude. So you're still touching the fingers and you say, I'm grateful for this as you're inhaling and exhaling. 
I'm grateful for this as you inhale and exhale. And I'm grateful for this and you inhale and exhale. And, and I discovered I didn't have to use both hands to do it. I could have my hands on the steering wheel and I could just press my thumb into the steering wheel and press the finger. And so I could be driving with all of my attention, but breathing and being grateful. Cause I used to be in traffic a lot. Um, I used to have to drive an hour and a half in the morning to get to the studio to do the show before we moved. So I was in the car a fair amount. And it was almost like this, it was not almost, it was a meditative practice on gratitude. And it really helped me. Um, and I, and now I don't do it because I'm not in the car, but it's a, you know, it's a, uh, I can do it in other ways. So whatever way suits you, but finding the way every day to breathe and to remember, we all have things to be grateful for. Um, all of us are breathing. And some of you might be having trouble breathing today, but that's better than not breathing. So finding the way to live in gratitude, it's a much better way to be. And, and I think the day goes better. When I wake up and I'm not in gratitude, I'm a curmudgeon all day long, you know? Just remember, you have the choice. You can be in gratitude or you can be in want. Um, I like the idea of being the freedom from want. Ooh, that's a, that feels good. Uh, okay. So, uh, today it's time we're to, you know, our, our, we don't have a guest today. It's just you and me, all of us. And we're going to talk about the recipes for Thanksgiving. So uh, I want to start, I want to meet her because not everybody is on a special diet. Not everybody's gluten-free, not everybody's everything, right? So I want to have a little bit here for everybody. So I want to start with the classic um, turkey that uh, for those of you who will be having turkey and, you know, meat, poultry meat is a thing that you can do. Um, there's lots of different ways to cook a turkey. Um, I personally, um, cause I was, I, I was somebody who was a vegetarian and, um, started cooking Thanksgiving turkeys for, for the last, before this year, for five years, I ate chicken and turkey. So I actually got to taste the turkey, which I hadn't had in, I don't know, 30 years. And now I'm a vegan again. So I won't be having Thanksgiving turkey, but I will tell you that, um, I have a turkey recipe that's foolproof. Uh, super moist. It's not a pretty turkey. It's not about the pretty turkey that you see on the Norman Rockwell thing that's, you know, right side up. That's not what my turkey is about. But if you like a moist turkey and you, you know, um, you want it to be really well done, but not be dried out and be good for recipes later on and have it take very little time, I got your recipe right here. So, and the link to this recipe is on Facebook, uh, on a post that I did earlier today. So one of the keys, and I have a couple of props here, ready. One of the keys, um, to Thanksgiving is making sure that you have some good, and you could get turkey broth, but it's just much easier to get a good chicken broth. Turkey broth is hard to come by. And especially this year, it's probably hard to. Now I particularly like this brand. Um, because it is gluten free. Um, and not all chicken broth is gluten free. And you can do bone broth, but be careful that you're getting one that is gluten free. Um, I also like this one because it's organic and it's um, non GMO. And, you know, I, I just absolutely love that. So, the, and there are other brands too, but this is just the one that is my personal fave. And you can get this in most grocery stores now. Like you don't even have to go to the special grocery store to get it. It's, it's around. And I'm able to order this um, for delivery. Uh, so absolutely love it. This one does have a, a titch of sugar, cane sugar in it, but you can find ones that don't. For instance, the low sodium version of this organic that's Trader Joe's, no sugar in it. So I also like that one too, but Trader Joe's doesn't do Instacart. So I'm not getting Trader Joe's right now because uh, you have to go in and I'm not going in. So um, and you can use this for everything, everything under the sun. You can use this instead of oil to saute your vegetables. Um, just so useful. You can use this when you're making your mashed potatoes. If, if the people that you are uh, dining with can have chicken, uh, because that's important. I'm going to talk about the vegan alternatives here in just a second, but so you have your Turkey 
And um, I spent years searching for which one was the gluten-free. I really like a butterball turkey. Butterball turkeys are, uh, and please check for yourself anytime to make sure because things change. Um, but butterball turkeys have done very well by our family. They're very attainable this time of year. Um, and they cook up really well and nobody's had a reaction in our house. So I, I don't get paid anything by Butterball, but I've tried other brands. Butterball is, is my choice. I have one in the freezer. Part of the key to a Thanksgiving turkey is knowing how long to defrost it because they have to be defrosted to get the best possible roast on your turkey. So you have to look at the weight of the turkey and then you have to do it. You have to become a mathematician and the math almost never works out. Right. Um, I would, I would guess Amanda that a whole foods Turkey is gluten-free, but, uh, but you check with them, but I would guess that it is. Um, so anyway, you got to thaw that sucker and you got to think about the fact that when are you going to put it in the oven and how long are you going to cook it? Because there's this window that you can't just thaw it a week in advance, right? And have it sit there. Even in the refrigerator, they're only, they only stay good thawed for one or two days. So you really gotta have to do the math and it's always a problem for me, but it's, they'd say that it's um, for every five pounds, you have to give it 24 hours in the refrigerator to thaw. But it's, you know, I'm always afraid. I don't want the turkey to go bad. So what I end up having often is a turkey that's mostly thawed, but not entirely thawed. But how I work it out is that I rinse that sucker out really well. And you really got to clean the cavity out really well. Sometimes it'll come with all the organs stuffed in it. Sometimes they're wrapped in paper. You got to pull all that stuff out and you rinse that all out. So there, where, the, where the neck of the turkey is to the cavity, there is a hole. And there should be a hole. It gets frozen over. So you want to get your sink really, really clean, get everything moved away from the sink. You want to have it sanitized. And then you want to rinse that turkey off really well and make sure it's not splashing. And then you want to sanitize everything afterwards because it's raw poultry. And you got to be really careful about that. Some hydrogen peroxide, great deal. Um, to sand and it gets your kitchen nice and clean and set up. So um, I, I actually enjoy that part of it. I scrub the whole sink down uh, before I, you know, wash the turkey. And then once the turkey is in the oven, the very next thing I do is re-scrub everything in the counters down so it's all sparkly clean and I know it's been sanitized. So you wash that turkey out, you get it all cleaned out. I put my roasting pan on the counter next to me. Um, and this is an optional thing, but it's what I like to do. I don't like the racks uh, because they're a pain in the neck to clean afterwards. And I'm lazy. So somebody had taught me years ago, don't do the rack. That's where you put your vegetables. You put the vegetables on the bottom and they become the rack for the turkey. You get a twofer. Vegetables that are roasted and have all that rich flavor from the turkey drippings that either make a great gravy puree, um, or you can serve them up as a side dish for the vegetables, love it. So I will take onions and garlic and potatoes and carrots, and sometimes I, you know, whatever I have, squash, whatever, and I put them in the, like I make a bed for the turkey in the bottom of the roasting pan. Now I've cleaned off the turkey, um, and I take all the organ meats and the neck, and I stick them in one end of the roasting pan so that I know which end, because necks are full of bones and I wanna make sure I don't include that in the gravy. But I put all of that in one end of the roasting pan so that I know where it is. And later on, my dogs love to eat the heart and the kidneys and all of that stuff. That's, that's a big Thanksgiving treat for them. They know, they smell that turkey and they know that they're gonna get some of that. But I've got the vegetables all throughout and I throw herbs like um, fresh rosemary, and sage in there and a little bit of salt and pepper. And I've got my turkey all cleaned out now and I set the turkey on top of those vegetables. But here's the trick, I put it upside down. Not my idea, taught this. But um, so normally when you see all the turkeys and they look all pretty and there's the breast at the top of it, right? If you put the breast down, it actually makes for the moist turkey. And here's the other trick. Um, is that you get two organic oranges 
and they need to be organic because you're not going to peel them and you don't want to put pesticides into your turkey, right? Two organic oranges, you still wash them off really good and then you take a knife and you stab them like 20 times. And you take one orange and you stick it in the cavity of the turkey and you take the other orange and you stick it in the right where the neck was, right? And you fold the skin over the orange and, and now it's still upside down with the oranges stuffed in. What those oranges do is they heat up inside the turkey and they bleed out the juice, which means it's self-basting with orange juice, which is natural and fabulous, gives this very slight flavor to it that everybody who comes to my house goes gazonga for. You can put other fruits in too. There have been times that I've put um, oranges and lemons and plums in. You know, I mean, just depends on what your jam is, but I'm lazy. Two oranges, boom stabbed. And if you don't stab them, they don't bleed, right? They'll explode. So <laughs> make sure you stab them, stick them in. Now, I also will sometimes, if I'm getting fancy schmancy, I will coat the inside with some olive oil and salt and pepper and throw some herbs in there. Sometimes I'm too lazy for that. Sometimes if I really want to be Martha Stewart, um, before I put the turkey in, there's there's a trick that the, the skin of the turkey, you know how it's sort of like coming up over the end? You can stick your hand and pull apart the skin from the turkey on the breast. Um, it's kind of slow going, but you kind of break the, the membrane with your fingers and you can stick like bay leaves and rosemary and sage leaves in and it makes a nice mosaic on the breast of the turkey and you know it's really pretty again still put it upside down um but you know a lot of times too lazy can't be bothered right i want to get that turkey in the oven so i've got the bed of vegetables i've got the turkey upside down i take olive oil and salt and pepper and i give the whole turkey a rub down right and i'm almost ready to stick it in the oven and then i put a cup of chicken broth just pour it right in the bottom where the vegetables are. I cover the turkey. I have a cheap roasting pan, possibly $14 at, at uh, Walmart. I have to pull a rack out, to, but it'll just, uh, even if it doesn't quite meet the lid, I, like, I prefer to cook without um, the aluminum foil because I don't want to add those chemicals, right? Um, but you can do it with, uh, but the key is to cover it. And I, you know, pop that in the oven and I follow the instructions that came with the bird about how long to cook it and at what temperature. The, the great thing is that with the oranges, I don't ever have to baste that thing. And I will have a turkey that is just melt in your mouth, fall off the bone, fabulousness and makes super whatever you want to do. And when you go to clean the turkey, you know, when you want to get everything off of the bones later on, uh, it's it's like no work. You just pull the bones out and the bones are gone. Now, I want to encourage you to use those bones when you do take them off, stick them all in a soup pan, put a little bit more of this and some water in and a little bit of vinegar. Or, uh, or you can take the oranges because there's enough citrus still in them from the cavity, stick that in. What the orange and the vinegar does is it pulls all of the good nutrients out of the bones so that you're making turkey bone broth that you want to cook with for the next couple of weeks, I'm telling you, it's the best thing. If you've got anybody in the house that's not well, um, giving them bone broth is a really important thing to do. So, and in that way you're using the whole turkey. You really got your money worth. Good morning, Christina. So um, that's the trick. Now, it does, uh, the, what will happen if you want crispy skin um, for the last hour, you might wanna take the lid off to get crispy skin. Um, or prop it up a little bit so that you get crispy skin. You'll get crispy skin on the back. I know some people who only cook it for a little while with the breast down and turn it. I'm too lazy for that. I've had it fall apart before and I don't like, it dries out the breast. I prefer to cook it that way, but that does not make the pretty turkey for the centerpiece. If you need a pretty tur turkey for the centerpiece, my recipe is not your recipe. Or you make two turkeys, I don't know. But if you want good tasting turkey, that's a good, and it's GFCF. There's absolutely nothing in it that, you know, would make it non-GFCF. Okay, so let's move on to talking about stuffing, okay? On the, the website, I gave you Nancy's stuffing recipe, which is great. Nancy, uh, Nancy's a great cook. I don't know if you guys know that about her. But um, 
she encourages you to get some some form of meat and her preference is a package of turkey sausage and you'll want to make sure that that's gluten-free casein free but a lot of turkey sausage is my child likes an oyster stuffing so we put smoked oysters in his stuffing and we add sage to it uh, but you also want to add a half a cup of celery half a cup of onion and what you want uh, one and a half cups of the chicken broth. I'm telling you, this becomes the iron giant of the kitchen for Thanksgiving. Um, a package of stuffing mix. This is the brand that we got this year. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, a lot of times you can get it in a regular grocery store now. Sprouts carries, I think I got this from Sprouts. Uh, Whole Foods carries it, but a lot of regular groceries are carrying a stuffing mix. You've got to be careful though because some of them have milk in them, like the Trader Joe's one, milk. Uh, and the other brand of this, they have one, this is the plain stuffing, the savory one, some of it has milk in it. Um, this also has yeast in it and it has some brown sugar and it has eggs in it. So you wanna be aware if you have um, issues. The uh, it, We have a recipe and, um, and we have the video for it for using a bread from Anna and baking the bread first, your GFCF bread, and then making the stuffing with that bread. That's intensive. I'm way too lazy for that. But uh, our old producer, uh, Emily Goodwin, did that for us. And she's it's on our YouTube channel. You can look it up. Um, but so this makes it easy. You saute the onions and celery. You add two eggs. Um, you add the chicken broth and you let it, and you add this to it and you let it all stand and then you put it in a grease thing and you cook it. Um, now for me, I add oysters and sage to it because that's what my kiddo likes is the oysters. You can add whatever you want to it. I put chorizo in it before and you know, my husband loved that. So if you're looking for a gluten-free stuffing, basically all it really is, you guys, is some herbs and and it's bread. So you could go and just buy the bread that you like that's gluten free, chop it up, uh, let it sit out, um, you know, cover it with a dish towel, but let it sit out so that it dries out um, to make yourself a stuffing. So, um, but you flavor you flavor whatever your flavor profile is. Okay. Uh, moving on to the mashed potatoes, uh, because a lot of people go, I don't know how to make a mashed potato and make it gluten-free, casein-free. Well, first of all, if you're super duper lazy, I always have this around in the house. This I get this at Sprouts, organic mashed potatoes, and the ingredients are organic potato flakes, organic potatoes. Uh, gotta love that. There's no extra added chemicals in this. This makes it super duper easy Sometimes I'll be making my son a shepherd's pie and I, I don't, get, and this is something that I make after Thanksgiving is that I take the leftover turkey. I usually have a leftover gluten-free pie crust um, and I take some frozen vegetables, chop up the turkey, throw it in the pie crust. And then I want to make it a shepherd's pie. So I want to put mashed potatoes on, but there's no mashed potatoes. And I want to do this really quickly. This is super duper quick. Now it tells you um, that to do this, you want to add milk, uh, water and butter. So there's a lot of different things that you can do. A lot of times, instead of milk, we add that chicken broth. You could add vegetable broth. They make wonderful low sodium, um, vegetable broth. Uh, it will color it darker. You just need to know that it's going to be more the color of, um, uh, like mashed sweet potatoes. Um, but great flavor, right? Um, but you could just do water. I know people that have done it with coconut milk. That's a little too rich for me. And obviously you do your, um, vegan butter. Um, you, Hey, for those of you in the UK, you don't, you, you can still do this. You don't have to celebrate the, the Thanksgiving. You can make these recipes because a lot of these are things we do all through the holidays, right? So, um, a little bit of, you can do half and half chicken broth and uh, broth and water or half vegetable broth and water. You can do all water. It still tastes pretty good. I'll tell you what I like uh, <laughs> that I'm not having this year. Uh, but you take the mashed potatoes and you can do this with potatoes too. I'm just saying if you want to be super duper easy um, is to add some daya cheese to it and um, tofuti sour cream, which is vegan. 
I like, uh, thank you for asking Amanda, the butter that I like, we do earth balance, the organic one. That's, that's our jam. Although I will tell you if you can do cashews and if your child can do cashews, there's the one that's Mykonos cultured vegan butter. Ooh, that's some good stuff. It's made from cashews. Uh, ooh, it's good, good, good stuff. That's I like, I wouldn't even use that as butter. That's like really good. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So look, I'm getting all foodie excited. So anyway, you can do the mashed potatoes. I'll tell you when I make mashed potatoes, my trick is that, um, cause there's so many things that have to happen all at the same time with Thanksgiving is that after I get the turkey in the oven and the turkey's got to cook for, you know, between three and five hours. Um, what I like to do is get all my potatoes peeled and put them in the crock pot. And I will put them in the crock pot with a little bit of chicken broth, um, a very little bit of water and a little bit of that uh, earth balance. And you let that cook. And whenever you're ready, uh, when the turkey is ready, and the thing about it is nice is that you can't overcook the potatoes in the crock pot. You just put them on medium uh, and then you mash them when you're ready when it's like, and, you, and I mash them right in the crock pot container and they're still staying warm and, and I add, um, you know, some more butter and salt and pepper to it. All, all good. Okay. What have I forgotten? Let's talk about the pumpkin pie. Now um, it's so great because now more than ever, there are um, gluten-free pie crusts that are available to you and you can order them through Amazon. You can order them through a lot of services, or you can go to most stores, have them now. Even like regular grocery stores have a lot of times one freezer that is dedica dedicated to, you know, specialty food items. Um, so, and they're pretty good. Uh, you can also get mixes to make pie crust, but Again, too lazy. I just don't have the time anymore to do that. I made a lot of pie crusts earlier in my life. And then I tried to make gluten-free ones and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm through with that. I like a nice frozen one. They come two to a thing. They're a little on the expensive side, but I, I like to think that my time is important enough that that makes it worthwhile. Um, and so uh, Nancy's got the best pumpkin pie recipe. I've tried a lot of pumpkin pie recipes. You'll even see if you go to some of the blog posts that I have, that I have other pumpkin pie recipes. This is the one. It is on our Autism Live blog. Uh, and her stuffing recipe is there too. So the secret ingredient, I'm just going to warn you, this is not about a healthy pumpkin pie. If you have health issues and issues with cholesterol and things like that, this is not your pumpkin pie. But, uh, and this one also has sugar in it and I've done it without sugar. I've done it with maple sugar. I've done it with honey. It's better with the sugar. Most things are, um, but the secret ingredient in Nancy's pumpkin pie that makes it set up nice and look just like a regular pumpkin pie and taste just like a regular pumpkin pie is the coconut cream. That's what she uses instead of the milk, um, in her pumpkin pies. So, other than that, it's pretty like everything else. It's three quarters of a cup of sugar. It's the cinnamon, the salt, the ginger, the cloves, two eggs, a can of pumpkin, a can of coconut cream. Hear me, not coconut milk. Uh, I will probably be making it this year with coconut milk and it will be runny. Um, and I will live with that. Um, and if you want to as well, but if you want the full, like mm, sets up really nice, has the consistency of a pumpkin pie and is so rich. It's so fabulous. Um, coconut cream. Most grocery stores have that now, uh, get yourself a can of that. So, um, and you make it just like a regular pumpkin pie. You mix all the ingredients together. You, um, cook the, the pumpkin, the, excuse me, the pie crust, just for a little while um, before, um, actually this says to put it in it without cooking it beforehand. I think that's a good plan. Um, and then it takes 45 to 50 minutes to bake. Um, the frozen pie crust, I've got one, it's like wholesome, I can't think what the name of it is, but it's the one, almost everybody carries it. It's like the one and I, it's called wholesome something is in the name of it. Um, but you'll, you'll find it, but just be careful because they also make a gluten filled one. And so you have to make sure I, more than once I have purchased 
you know, pie crusts getting ready for the holidays. Cause usually I buy them ahead and I'll buy like two sets of two. So I've got four pie crusts. Right. And, uh, I get them home and I realize ah, I bought the one that doesn't say gluten-free. So be careful with that. Um, but they're really, really fabulous. Okay. So that's the pumpkin pie. And obviously, you know, same diff, if you wanted to make any other kind of a pie, uh, if you want to make an apple pie, uh, a lot of times we like to, you can, you can get the, the frozen ones. You need to thaw them before you cook them, but you can thaw a crust and use it as a top crust, right? If you want to do that. But a lot of times we will do like the crumble crust on the top for an apple pie, uh, which is easy enough to do. It's just sugar and cinnamon and a, a little bit of, um, I use a, a gluten-free pancake mix and the brand that I love for that. And that's my sort of go-to baking mix that I use for pretty much anything that I need is it's the Namaste gluten-free pancake and muffin mix. And I order that from Amazon and I get a case of it. Um, so, oh, we don't, I don't, you can go to Whole Foods and get whole gluten-free casein-free pies already made. Um, they're frozen and I haven't done that. I, I just haven't tried them. Nancy's recipe is that good. And I had that before they started making those. So, um, you know, the, it's pretty fabulous. Now, for those of you who are not gluten-free, casein-free, and you're like, all right, Shannon, like enough with the diet stuff. I don't, I don't want to know about the diet stuff. One of the things that I shared with you that I share every year around this time with the public is my mother's recipe for scalloped corn. And it's the best thing ever. Um, and, and the link to it is on our Facebook page right now with the other recipes. It's Patty Penrod scalloped corn. And basically what it is, is it's a really, uh, oh, it's so good. It, uh, it's a, it's a corn casserole that, um, it's, it, she used to call it like a pudding. Um, so it's not quite the consistency of a muffin, um, it's, it's a little bit looser than that, but it's not, it sets up a little bit more than your typical casserole. And we always make this every year. I, I don't, uh, I can't eat it the way my mother made it because it's filled with gluten and it's filled with beef tallow and it's filled with, um, dairy ingredients. Right. Um, so I can't eat it the way she does. I will sometimes make a gluten-free casein free version of it. And I'll give you that in a second, but let's talk about how she made it because I now make this every year, um, for locally, they do gobble, gobble, give, and we give pans of this, um, to help feed the homeless. And that always makes me feel great on Thanksgiving, knowing that my mother's scallop corn is in someone's belly, helping to keep him warm. And it is a spiritual experience. Her scallop corn is a spiritual experience. So uh, the ingredients, you ready for this? It's one onion, a large onion, two boxes of the Jiffy cornbread mix, that really cheap stuff. It's like between 25 cents and 50 cents in your regular grocery store. And if you read the ingredients, it's a car accident. It has beef tallow in it. It's just like, oh my gosh, it's like the worst possible ingredients in the world. It makes this thing really great. So two boxes of that, three eggs, an entire stick of butter melted, two cans of whole kernel corn, and you don't drain them. You want all of the salt water that's in them and two cans of creamed corn as well, then 16 ounces of sour cream. Uh, and you throw all of that into a big bowl and you mix the hay on the out of it. And it looks horrible. It looks, it's like this light yellow lumpy. Um, it, it looks like somebody was sick. Okay. I'm just going to tell you, and you pour all of that into a buttered baking dish. Uh, like a, you know, uh, one that's like about this thick, like a lasagna pan. And you put that in the oven and you bake it at 350 for an hour. And I'll tell you how, you know, it's done is that the, the middle of it, um, should just not jiggle. So if you were to just jiggle the pan a little bit, the middle, it should move a little bit, but it shouldn't like jiggle, right? Um, and then you can serve it hot or you can serve it cold. It's good no matter what. And I fed this to everybody on the planet and it is, it's a spiritual experience. Um, now, 
years ago, I started looking at it and going, okay, how can I make this gluten-free, casein-free? So Pamela's makes a really great cornbread mix that's gluten-free and it's dairy-free. So I use that instead of the Jiffy. And now I've eliminated the tallow and the flour and all of that stuff. Um, Tofuti makes uh, a great sour cream. It's expensive, but it's worth it. I don't like their sour cream just to eat on something like a baked potato, but to bake into something fabulous. Um, and it's also very good in, in mashed potatoes as well. So, um, and then I don't do the creamed corn. Um, so what I do instead of the creamed corn is that I'll add like a cup of coconut milk to it. And that, uh, so I just add, uh, instead of two cans of corn, uh, and by the way, I get the organic non-GMO corn. Um, I add four cans of corn and, and I add a half a, a half a cup to a cup to get the right consistency of the coconut milk. Ooh, it's good. It's really good. Uh, okay. Lori says she can't wait for the toy list. Were you the person who emailed me yesterday saying that you were waiting for the toy list? Here is the deal with the toy list. The toy list is done and it's ready. It just has not been posted because part of what they have to do is put all of the links so that once you click it, um, you can go right to the site and purchase the toy right there. And that's just taking a little bit longer. It is going to, I'm, it, it could happen any minute now, but I'm promised that it will be active by Black Friday. But if you were wanting to shop before that, I have the PDF of it and I can share the PDF of it, but the public version of it um, will be active before Black Friday. So I apologize for the hold on that. But if you really need the toy list now, Make sure you email me. I can send you the PDF of it right now. That's all done. They're just doing the behind the scenes on the, the website, even as we speak. You can email me at s.penrod at autism-live.com. So, okay. Um, that gets you, uh, at this point, you now, I, I've given you a recipe for turkey, for corn, for pumpkin pie, for stuffing. Uh, what else does that leave? for your Thanksgiving dinner. One of our favorite things um, that I just ordered some of the other day is Martinelli's sparkling apple juice that comes in different flavors, like their sparkling apple grape and whatever. For us, that really makes it the holidays, um, that everybody has something to toast with and that it's super um, you know, festive. Uh, I will sometimes water that down with just plain sparkling water so that we aren't getting as much sugar. Then that's better for everybody, but it's still, it's pretty fabulous. Martinelli's and I, I of course, shocking to all of you, prefer the organic one. Uh, the, they do make the organic flavors. Uh, what else do you guys like to make for Thanksgiving? By the way, they have organic um, cranberry sauce that comes in a can or uh, you can make your own. But uh, lazy, I'm um, organic in a can and it's gluten-free, casein-free, but it has sugar in it. So there is that. Uh, I will tell you that it used to be, and you'll look as you see some of the, some of the blog posts are from Autism Live. Some of them are from my blog site, which I very rarely post on anymore, uh, which is Shannon Penrod Speaks. And I used to have a blog site that was just for diet and recipe for autism that was autism diets, autism diet, uh, dot wordpress com, And you'll see that there's a lot of recipes on there, but it was from when Jem was littler and we just didn't have the things available that we have now. It was like how it was the olden days of, and I cooked a lot and I did a lot of experimentation. We ate a lot of things that didn't taste like the things that we eat now. And I'm infinitely lazier now. But if you want to do it the other way, or or the other thing was that we were so clean with his diet back then, and there was no sugar in his diet. So, you know, there was practically no honey in his diet. So if you're interested in that, you can go and look at all the blog posts on those sites to see. I, I used to do blog posts about exactly what my son ate, like what brands of things he ate. Um, but I think the last one I posted was from 2011 because right around then it got easier. 
Um, we, we got a little bit more leeway with his diet, um, and saw that, you know, he could have a little bit of sugar and it wasn't messing him up at that point. It did earlier, but we also, I mean, all of a sudden Betty Crocker had gluten-free cake mixes. Stop Betty Crocker. Like, you know, that was insane to me. Um, I, I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. If you're wanting to make a yellow cake, oh my gosh, the King Arthur yellow cake gluten-free mix is to die for. Um, it's really, really fabulous. But what else do you guys make? Write in the chat right now and tell me like, wh what's something you'd really like to make, but you'd like to make it healthier or you'd like to make it gluten-free or maybe your kid is on a keto diet and you're a little bit like, I don't know what to make. Because I can tell you, um, I'm not as up on keto diets, but there's a, if it's a vegetable thing, I know how to cook vegetables. Um, and I learned how to make a turkey. But um, yeah, somebody else, King Arthur is great. I love their pancake mix too. I haven't tried that. I'll have to try that. Um, and I will tell you that a lot of these things I order now just on Amazon. And, and have them delivered, especially anything that's flour-based. It's just easier. I get a case of it. It gets delivered. And uh, mac and cheese, what milk are you using for that? So I don't. Um, I don't know if I have any of them in here. Hold on one second as the host leaves the show. So one of two things that I, if I'm being super lazy, uh, we do this, um, Dea. And we don't add milk to it. I don't even know if it asks you to add milk to it. I don't think it does. Uh, return to saucepan, the cheese, add the cheese sauce to it. No, it doesn't say. And I, and I wasn't adding any milk to it. So that's, I've got it upside down now. And they make this in all different flavors. They even have a bacon flavor that scares me, but my son says it's good. Um, now, if I'm going to make mac and cheese from scratch, not from a box, I'm being a little bit more, um, then I love, Lisa Ackerman from Taka's recipe for no mac and cheese and no mac. Yeah. Mac and no cheese. That's what it is. Mac and no cheese. And that is on our website, her making that under the tab, the, you know, home living, there's the tab for the show what's left. And what she does is she takes gluten-free pasta and she takes a, there's a brand of, um, it's butternut squash soup. And um, you have to be careful because there's some that have milk, but it's one that doesn't have milk. And she uses just Dea shred cheese. That's fabulous. I love the taste with the butternut squash instead of the milk. And it's really good. It has a slightly sweet flavor to it. Um, and my son just slightly prefers the Dea um, mix to that. And it's less work for me. But um, I, I don't know if it's Pacific or what's the other one, Imperial. Um, but you, you have to read the ingredients on them. It's the one that doesn't have sugar in it is the better one. Uh, and there is a low sodium version of it, which I think is better in general. Um, but it, it's the right color. It makes the, the mac and cheese like a, like a bright orange. And it tastes really good but it's butternut, butternut squash soup. My mom has made mac and cheese, would like to learn how to make a healthier version. Well, I do think that, <clears throat> you know, the butternut squash is like the healthiest um, thing that we get. Um, yep, that is good. We did that for years when she posted it. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, it's really, really good. I, I do think, um, I'm going to go back to this for a second, that these boxes of broth, and soups have helped me out over the years. I currently, because like I said, vegan, I'm doing the, I think it's specific. I don't have one of them right now, um, but the vegetable broth and it's, it's low sodium and I use it instead of oil to saute vegetables. Um, super duper good. Um, but if you can do the chicken broth, love, love, love the chicken broth. Um, really, really great. And I do encourage you after you've done the turkey to put all the bones and everything in a pan and cook them for a little while and then freeze it. That stuff is liquid gold. Uh, in fact, you can take everything, you, you know, if you want to, when you're done with the turkey, if you've done the onions and the, 
and the carrots and the potatoes and, and you didn't want to eat them afterwards and you didn't want to include them in a broth, you can take all of that, dump it into the soup pan and then uh, and boil it with that vinegar, like I was saying before, for the, the turkey broth. And then take, what you do is just strain it all. So all you're left with is the broth, freeze that, throw everything else into the trash. Uh, you'll have gotten all of the good ingredients out of, out of all of it and all the good taste out of it. And you can put that in anything. You can put that, you can bake that into a muffin. You can put it into a meatloaf. You can make a soup with it. Uh, I know people who put them, in, put the, the bone broth in ice cube trays and, and freeze it and then, and then take them out of the ice cube trays, put them in plastic bags and freeze it. So they only take a certain amount. Again, I'm too lazy for that. I put it in freezer bags and then just use the whole thing all at once. Um, it's all good. Uh, there are other recipes too that are more in the vegan thing. Uh, I do the Amy's vegan, but it's from scratch. I'm missing one of the comments. Michelle, I did not get to see what you said. And I, for some reason, I did not bring up the chat um, early enough to see that. So Michelle, I, met, I missed what you said. Uh, I, I apologize. We are we are out of time, in fact. But I just want to say happy Thanksgiving to all of you. We are back tomorrow live. Tomorrow, in fact, we have Vince Redman, who's going to be with us. Nancy Allspa Jackson will be here. We'll cover some news stories. And Vince, who's a licensed marriage and family therapist, is going to talk about some of the stressors right now. In particular, so many of you are writing me about the anxiety that you're having because your distance learning plan is changing or has just changed or you think it's going to change um, because of the increase in, in COVID cases. So Vince is going to help us. Um, oh, she said, have a great day and thanks for the recipes. Thank you, Michelle. We appreciate that. Thank you, Traven. Um, in any case, we uh, will be here with Vince and he's going to help us to deal with some of the stresses that we're coming up with. We are back on Monday with the fabulous Bonnie Yates answering your questions. And then on Tuesday, we have a very special show on Tuesday. We are going to, normally we make a video, we go to a toy store and we review some of our top toys in our toy guide. And I usually take one person with me to do that. And over the years, I've taken a host of many wonderful people, including my husband. And, and twice now, I've taken two of Dr. Doreen Grampuche's children with me to do that, her two daughters. And uh, I'm just so missing getting to do it with her son. So here's the great news, because we can't go to a toy store right now. So we're going to do a live uh, show on Tuesday as if we're at the toy store. And I've got a bunch of the toys here with me. And I'm sending a bunch of the toys to Dr. Grampy Shea's house. And she's going to be there, not with one of her children, but all three. Yes, supposedly for the first time, her son, Sonny, who is a stitch, he is absolutely one of the funniest people I've ever met, will be with us. And, and together, the, the five of us, five of us, yes, four or five, yes, of us will review some of our favorite toys that are, out, are, are in this year's toy guide. So I guarantee you it's going to be mayhem and hilarity. I hope that you will join us to be a part of that. That'll be our last live show before Thanksgiving. And then we'll go right into on Wednesday the day before Thanksgiving, our Thanksgiving marathon, some of the best of 2019 um, and not, not 19, 2020. It's like my mind wants to reject 2020. Some of the best of what we've been doing this year with you guys, with your help. So that's what it looks like. Uh, but if I don't see you before Thanksgiving, please have a happy, healthy, and safe Thanksgiving for everybody else. I will see you back here tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Good morning and welcome <laughs> to Dr. from Shannon and Nancy. I'm seeing you. See me, I'm seeing. Let me try. We're, we're trying. There we go. There I am. Hello. There you are. Hi, Shannon. Hi, we're so sorry you guys had nothing but technical problems this morning. So thrilled that you guys stuck it out with us because we're a little bit late getting on. But I'm Shannon Penrod. And I'm Nancy Allscott Jackson. And we're thrilled to be here with you guys, uh, but continuing to be plagued by technical difficulties. It's the it's our our gremlins and nemesis. This, uh, so that's how we're doing. Good morning to Jeremiah and to Dano. 
Uh, Jeremiah says, sup all. And that's, that's what sup right now is. I'm irked with the technical difficulties. Nothing would work this morning. So I don't know what that's about. How are you, Nancy? I'm doing great, Shannon. Well, I'm glad to hear that because uh, you're a wonderful person. And, and I hope that, uh, that you have a wonderful, uh, grateful Thanksgiving. I know that yes. it's a really in right around the corner. Are we going to be talking to our guest, Vince Redmond, about that today? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, we are going to be talking about that. And we're going to be talking a little bit about there's a lot of people that are having stress right now because uh, with the increase in the numbers of COVID, uh, a lot of schools are once again changing their distance learning plan. Kid, kiddos that had gone back to school um, have, are being sent home or some areas they're going early to holiday break. And a right. lot of parents are and caregivers are having a little bit of stress about that. So yeah. Vince it's is been a really it. stressful time for everybody, I think. Yeah, and I don't know about everybody else, but I think um, the overwhelming um, feeling that I'm hearing from everyone, and certainly that I'm experiencing, is that you know we're really done. We're really, we're really done, and we're exhausted with all of it. I just want to caution everybody that the numbers don't warrant. You know, I my husband said, you know, I'd like to get out. We've been so good from the beginning, and uh, quarantining and and really isolating, um, extreme isolation. And um, he was like, well, you know, I'd like to you know, go here, there, or wherever. And, and I said, yes, except now is the exact moment when we should not. So uh, everybody's being encouraged to stay home. If you have to go out to wear your masks and take all due precautions. So it makes it hard. And I my feel, you know, I mean, there's so many people who've been hit hard by this. I think the added pressure of the fact that for a lot of people, whatever relief they were getting financially, a lot of it is coming to end in like 45 days. Uh -huh. and, and there's no, there's nothing to take its place at, at, as of, you know, this moment in time. So I think that adds to the stress. Plus it's the holidays and people, you know, this is the time when we normally commute. Um, so there's a lot going on. Vince is going to talk with us about that. I am glad to hear that uh, we have somebody who we knew was having a spinal MRI this morning um, and glad to hear that it went well and keep us posted. We'd love to hear when he's awake and all as well. So um, I want to take just a second and remind everybody this show is meant to be interactive. We're here with you live right now. Uh, the date is the Friday, the 20th of 2020. Uh, this will be an archival show somewhere later on when we are not in this kind of situation and we'll look back and go, oh, look how we did the show. Looking forward to that. But uh, we're live right now on YouTube, Periscope, Twitter, and on Facebook. And we're also live on our homepage, autism-live.com. We encourage you, if you're watching us live, to watch in one of those big four, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, or Twitter, because you can write into us on that platform and it immediately shows up here in our chat. I'm saying good morning to Amanda and Michelle. Thank you for being with us and good morning to Christina. So um, if you wanna watch us recorded in podcasts, we're all over the place, all of your major, where all of your podcasts are, I think we are. If you find that we are not where you watch your podcast, please let us know, we'll be happy to get ourselves there. We are free in all of the places that we are available. And I, I, I'm very proud of that, that we, mm -hmm. there's good information and I hope inspiration for all of you that's available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that it's entirely free to you. Um, and we've been doing that now for almost 10 years. And that's many times people have said, let's charge the viewers. And, and I would say, you know, nope, 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 we're not doing that, we're not doing that, and was able to hold the line, and I'm glad that we were able to do that. But please, please share us. That's how we stay on the air, is by having viewers uh, like you who watch the show, and if you'll tell other people about it, then more people will know about it, right, Nancy? That's right, and Christina is thanking you for your good words there. Yes. You, Christina, and we encourage everybody to write into us and tell us your issues and concerns, especially today when we have the benefit of having Vince Redman on the show a little bit later. Yeah, he's a licensed marriage and family therapist, but he's sort of extra. I've called him the unicorn before because he not only is an LMFT, but he used to be a behavior technician. He used uh -huh. to 
Uh, that was his job for many years. He started as a very young man. So um, he understands that component of what you're going through when you're doing an early intensive behavioral intervention, which I hope you are if you have a kiddo. Hey, by the way, th I want to point out that this show um, is meant for everybody in the autism community that starts with folks who are on the spectrum. They are the beating heart of our community, but we include in our community everyone who loves those individuals. So that's caregivers, that's grandparents, it's husbands, wives, doctors, uh, teachers, therapists. Shannon, are you aware that it's National Caregivers Month? Well, you know, uh, we had a guest last Friday who had told us about that. And I was like, no, I, I didn't get that memo. I just uh, heard it today from Autism Speaks did a post saying it's National Caregivers Month. But, but uh, Kirsten said that from, um, uh, from Autism Society uh, on last week's show. That was how I found out about it. Um, uh -huh. so that's that's how I knew. Um, right. Okay. Uh, I don't, uh, Christina, I'm not sure. Can you look at that and tell me, because I, I misread that. Can you tell me what that means? I don't, know, what, I don't uh, know what prosecutor means. Yes. She said her husband oh, oh. is with her to prosecute okay. her daddy wants to be a part of helping his son. But okay, but I don't know what the prosecutor has to right. do with it. But we'll, you know, I think that's probably one of those spell check things. I don't know what right. I spent right. to somebody the other day and we laughed so hard and so long because I was trying to say something and it, it put in some other strange word that was so random. I think they do it deliberately just to give us a laugh. Um, so I don't know if that's the word that you meant to put there, but uh in any case we'll we'll wait uh while you figure while you tell us what it was that you christine oh, christine Kerr. Kerr. your husband got a lawyer and we were worried and we were like but how does that uh equate to him wanting to be a part of helping where i where that's i was like we got a prosecutor that's uh that's something else nancy you look beautiful today that color is thank gorgeous you. on thank you thank you shannon thank you, you. You look like you could be a Bond girl or uh, not not quite a Bond villain. You look too good to be a, a Bond villain, <laughs> uh, but, it's, but it's very swanky. Uh, I like that neckline on you. Uh, okay, so uh, why don't we jump in and cover our news stories? We've got a couple that are good and one that's horrible. Just giving you guys the, you know, the 411 beforehand. Um, so I thought that this was really interesting that they're saying that hearing tests and babies, newborn babies response to a hearing test may be a really good predictor of which children might be on the autism spectrum. So, um, I don't, I'm going to be honest that, uh, I don't pretend to understand exactly what they're, you know, cause there's a whole bunch of things about why what it shows in the test. And, uh, you know, I'm not an expert, Nancy. I don't know if you totally get it, but. Well, but it's, I, it's kind of complex, but I think you've got the gist of it, which is that newborns exhibit neurophysiological variation associated with autism spectrum disorder. So yes. um, it's, it has to do with the hearing uh, yes. of, of newborns. This is, this is why we're being cautious, you guys, because it has to do with the V negative leg, uh, latency. So I don't really get what that is, but they're able to look at it, look at a bunch of people's uh, hearing tests, and they're able to pick out which kids later on ended up um, being diagnosed on the spectrum. So it might be a good predictor. Yeah. Did I cut yeah. you off, Nancy? No, you did yeah, not. You did. Uh, okay, so um, this is coming to us from uh, the Harvard Medical School in Boston. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's preliminary, but they did study 139,154 newborns and gave them the universal newborn hearing screening. And uh, 321 of those kids later were diagnosed with autism. And they were able to go back and look and see that their hearing tests were markedly different. Right. So there we go. Now, what does that mean to the world? Um, you know, imagine a world in which your child could, as a newborn, be checked and, and, and be flagged as someone who had the potential 
to be diagnosed with autism and what would you do differently? And Nancy, if you had known when you first held Wyatt in your arms that he was someone who may later have uh, the issues that he has had in regards to autism, would you have done anything different? Absolutely. Uh, I would have. Earlier interventions all the way around. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just think about like, I, I know for a lot of parents, and Nancy, chime in here if you feel this way too, I always say that the amount of time from when you first went, hmm, I think something's going on here until you actually got to something that was helpful, that exact amount of time is the amount of guilt you carry in a backpack on your back. Right. And, and you know, I, I think if we could empower parents to say, okay, your child doesn't have autism in this moment, but your child is at risk for autism, here are the things that we would like you to be particularly mindful of. Uh, I think that could be massive, massive game changer. Hey, May, saying hello to you. Hi, May. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, so, you know, something great. Okay, so now let's move on to the not so great. Yeah. Uh, um, although this story was really interesting to me, and I'll tell you why. But first, let's tell you what it is, that a gene therapy for uh, an autism linked condition, which is Angelman syndrome, um, had consequences of robbing two people of the ability to walk. That's a clinical trial for gene of gene therapy for Angelman syndrome. Now, for those of you that don't know what Angelman syndrome is, it's a rare genetic condition that's related to autism. Yeah. And there were a small group of people that they were doing this clinical trial with. And of course, I love that they were incredibly responsible. And the minute that they saw that it was causing a problem, they halted the trial. And that's why it's making the news. Uh, there was a drug developed by Ultragenics and Gen, X, Gen TX called GTX102. Um, there were different degrees of it that they were injecting into a small group of children, but um, first one child, um, one individual, I don't actually know the ages of the individuals in the, the test. Well, they were five to 15, so I do know that. Um, they recovered from this, we should say. It was not lasting. But I think scary for the participant. Yes. Um, and the one had... Uh, numbness and difficulty walking and the other one lost the ability to walk. Um, but, um, and they even say, even those that couldn't uh, support themselves on their legs are walking around fine. They are currently somewhat more coordinated now than they were before the study. I think part of the, part of the issue was that initially this drug had showed so much promise and this has slowed it down. Um, but I, I do think studies are important and looking at what consequences are and dealing with them responsibly, you know, is, is super important. It's very scary, Amanda. It's very, very scary. But again, as Nancy said, it did not, uh, persist and that, you know, in some cases they're a little bit more coordinated than they were before. So, yeah. And uh, here's what I found, what I thought was interesting. It said, um, while the safety issue is important to resolve, experts say, given that the therapy otherwise appears to be effective and the trial could guide treatment strategies for similar brain conditions. And I'm running if it could guide treatment strategies for autism. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's very possible. And, you know, I, I look forward to hearing what comes of this. I think sometimes there was a, there was a definite thing with the dosage that they would start slow and then add more. And when they got into the more intense doses is when they saw that this problem occurred. So it might be that they have to give the doses over a longer period of time and not have these issues. We'll look forward to seeing what it is, but very scary for those families and for those individuals that were going through that. I can't even imagine. Um, and so, uh, but an important story to cover. And our last story, which I think just made me so happy. Yes, you know, it's a real feel-good story. All of our kids, um, you know, have things that they like. And some of our kids have things that they obsess over or we call perseverate on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think that that's a negative. I just, you know, I have a much harder time buying into that. I think that when we can responsibly help them to grow and flex 
and and it's like a pizza dough that okay so they only are interested in you know uh i was just talking to a family the other day that's trains and you're you're familiar with this uh nancy that's like their kiddo only wants to talk about trains that's all they want to do and it's driving them bonkers we've all been there to some degree but when we can take that and you know if it's only thomas the tank can we have it now be about antique trains. Right. Can you build on it? Can you take yeah. that obsession or perseveration and tease it out into something bigger? Which yeah. is what parents do. I mean, I I look at Wyatt mm-hmm. and Wyatt is like a, an incredible artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and just, I just, because he loves to swish the paint around. That's a stem of his. And, and it's just so amazing the kinds of things that he can paint. Um, I, I look at Logan Shepard who, you know, he, he did this and then that turned to drumming He's a professional drummer. Right. CDs out, you know? So, um, you know, and sometimes it's not that clear cut. My son was interested, like we would perseverate on one thing and then he, you know, after a while he would perseverate on the next thing. And um, but you know, if I think about it, that's, that's maybe a little bit how I have been that, you know, that I would go and, and, and do this for a, lot, a little while. And then I would do this. And then, you know, I can see in my son where, where it's all starting to come together, all the things that he likes, you know, joining together. So uh-huh. I just think it's important that we feed those things. So here was a little boy in this story, uh, Jackson Maples, who's four years old and he lives in Missouri. And the thing that he perseverated on, are we ready for this, kids? Lowe's. <laughs> Lowe's hardware store. He was all about uh, Lowe's, even to the point where when he was like having a rough day and, and that they were just having a hard time, they would say, all right, let's get in the car. Let's go to Lowe's because it is his happy place. And, and he, what I Yeah, he particularly loved the mechanical objects at Lowe's, the roar of a fan, the thrum of a washing machine, and the tumbling cadence of the dryer were among his favorite fascinations. And so he loved to be in the appliance section. Uh, <laughs> they say that it's as if he had stepped in his own personal wonderland. See, this makes me happy because, you know, every, there should be people in life who get excited about appliances. Um, and, you know, so he, they would take, and I love uh, his mom, Shauna. Uh, would take him there as often as she could. Well, so Lowe's found out um, because everybody in the store just looked forward to seeing him and it brightened their day. And so um, they contact the the Lowe's head office and uh, they sent him like all this cool stuff. So he's got a a Lowe's vest now um, and they've given him so many things, including... I don't know if you guys have ever done on the, obviously I don't think this is happening in COVID, but once a month they would have a craft that you could go and do with your kiddos and they had the craft kits and stuff. So they'd given him a bunch of those and just made him an honorary associate. And I just gotta, gotta throw some love on Lowe's for doing this and making him feel so welcome. If they had some great photographs in the story of Jackson with, at Lowe's in his safety vest, looking at the various pieces of hardware and equipment. Really, really sweet. Yes, and they gave him a Lowe's football. I mean, they just gave him a bunch of stuff. He's got he's got Lowe's sl- swag galore, but I think it's more than that. I think, you know, they acknowledge that he's one of them. Mm-hmm. That he's an honorary associate, and that is what chokes me up. Um, because for a kiddo to feel that, at that age, I think we all want that for all of our kiddos. And to feel that at four, that's going to help him forever. And you know that someday that young man is going to work. At that Lowe's. little boy is going to be a young man and he's going to work at Lowe's. Yeah. And, yeah. and he's going to be one of the best Lowe's employees that they have. And the customers are going to come in and look forward to seeing him there. Um, this, this is how life should be. Um, and it is sometimes, and I think that we all need to be reminded of that. I remember when, when I was pregnant with Jem and had just had Jem at our local grocery store, there was a wonderful young man who um, had Down syndrome, who he 
was started out was working as a grocery bagger at our store. And in the period of time that you know, I got pregnant with, had Jem, and by, I think we moved away when Jem was like two. Um, he went from being the bagger uh, and everybody loved him. Like I would get in his aisle because he did the best job of bagging and he was so charming and personable and would talk to us. He was my favorite person. So I would deliberately get in the aisle that he was in and he would walk you to your car and help. Lovely young man. But he did such a great job that then he became one of the checkout people, was the best, the fastest, but still was charming. Then he became the head checker and then he became the assistant manager by the Isn't time. That's that a great story. And and I, you know, he was one of the things that I missed when we moved across town. And anytime we would be in that neighborhood, I would like go into that grocery store hoping to run into him. Uh, and occasionally would. But you know, that. I think when we can all get in that mindset, I, I know in other circumstances at another store where somebody was just being trained and clearly was someone, you know, I don't know what the diagnosis was or if there was a diagnosis, but they were having a hard time. And I remember a bunch of people complaining. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I just hope that people will be like Lowe's was. Yay, Lowe's. Thank you. Okay, we're, I'm going to drop out for a second, and we're going to welcome Vince. Uh, All right. We're having trouble with my camera, so we're, we're going to drop me out. Okay. Um, we have a viewer from uh, Austria, which is very exciting. Uh, Fifty Kagan, I believe their name is. So, um, hi, thank you for joining us. Yes. And, uh, do we have Vince now? I believe that we do. Let's let's. In fact, we might have been having him wait. I didn't realize because we started late. It's it's kind of late. Uh, we do so not have. Him. We've got. I wonder, him. I wonder if uh, talk amongst yourselves for a second. Say yes, Amber from Amber the UK. From the UK. Um, Austria, the Traven, UK. Traven, can you can Great you resend? Family. Traven, can you resend uh, Vince the the link because he may not have it. Thank you. Um, so wonderful. I'm wondering, um, I, I want to take just a second to go over what our schedule is for next week with right, our viewers right. um, and talk a little bit about Thanksgiving here in the United States, because we are less than a week away from our big gratitude holiday here in the, the United States. Uh, welcome, Amber. I see that you have a four-year-old on the spectrum. We're, we're so thrilled to have you here. Um, on Monday, we're going to be doing our regular show and Bonnie Yates will be with us and she'll answer any questions you guys have about special education from a legal standpoint, especially with all this new stuff going on. Um, and then on Tuesday, we're going to do a very special show, a live show with Dr. Grant Pichet and her three adult children that have never been all on at the same time. Usually, you know, I go to a toy store. Sometimes it's with Nancy. Sometimes it's with my husband. Sometimes it's with one of Dr. Grant Pichet's children. And we review toys to kick off our big festival of toys. We're not able to go to a toy store and film this year. And so we're going to, I'm, I've got a bunch of toys here and Dr. Grant Pichet and her kids will have a bunch of toys at their house and so we're going to play with toys in front of you, with you on Tuesday. Oh, that, live show. Okay, fun. That sounds like a fun show. Right. It should be absolutely hilarious because I'm sure it will be uh, a logistical nightmare. Uh, but I'm so looking forward to it. I have a room full of toys here that I can't wait to share with you guys. Our toy guide is coming out next week. Um, and so we're really excited. We paid particular attention this year to some of the challenges that you guys are face, facing, things to do on a break from distance learning, things to do that we're calling our boredom buster award, but that, you know, things that will help you to make um, uh, your living room be a playground, um, but they're all pretty uh, low cost. I really tried to make as many toys be under $10. In fact, there are several toys that are uh, under $20. There are several toys that are under $10 in the, the guide. So uh, we hope that you'll tune in. Starting on Wednesday of next week, though, we're doing our Thanksgiving marathon where we're going to be featuring a lot of the toys, some of the videos that you and I did in the past uh, uh -huh. at toy stores, plus a lot of toys from over the years because we've been doing the toy festival for 
eight years. Uh huh. Uh, so um, we're going to be sharing all of that with all of you. Um, oh, so it'll run Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So if you're missing oh, autism oh. live at any point during the week, you, all you have to do is tune in and it will be there. So we don't seem to have Vince yet. That might be part of our technical problems, but um, we, we have someone who's identified that they have a four-year-old on the spectrum, but he jumps up and down a lot and is that yeast. Um, and, you know, I want to preface anything that we say with the fact that neither Nancy or I are doctors. <laughs> and so we can share opinions, but, you know, I, I certainly don't know if it's yeast just based on whether he jumps up and down. Uh, it could be, but it could be a lot of other things too. Some of our kids just like um, the motion of the yes. jumping up and down and um, like the their vestibular system, which is uh, once again, we were talking about stems earlier. It's a yes. point of, a, of a stem. And you also say he giggles sometimes for no reason. Now I have heard that as a, as yes. a symptom of yeast, but as Shannon said, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is yeast. So there's a couple of ways that you could start to be a detective to see if it's yeast. Um, the first one being that you smell your child. Um, does your your child's head or feet or breath smell like yeast? Or um, my son's breath when he was in yeast um, overgrowth would smell like brandy like really good expensive brandy and his feet would smell like they just, they were like yeast buns. I mean, you know, who likes the smell of feet, but I used to love get high smelling his little <laughs> baby feet. They smelled so good and his head smelled like bread coming right out of the oven. So, um, you know, that would be one indication. Something that you can immediately do is look directly to your child's diet and go, okay, how much sugar, refined or otherwise, is your child having in their diet? And, and from there, look at how much carbohydrates. Now, Nancy, did they ever decide that, because um, Jem was diagnosed as having yeast overgrowth, but did, did they ever say that with Wyatt? No, we tested him several times and he did not show that he had yeast overgrowth every time we did the test. And yet, when you put him on the keto diet, which effectively removed all of those things from his right. diet, man, I mean, like just the way he looks changed so much. He, right. Well, he lost 45 pounds when we took him off carbohydrates and the keto diet. He just, he, you know, he just looks entirely different now. Yeah, um, did you see behavior changes too? Yes. I think he was calmer. Um, on the keto diet, I think um, some of his autism symptoms were less pronounced. There you go. So there are some tests that you can do for yeast. Um, they're not always conclusive, but what I want to encourage you to do is um, take a look at the diet, see how much sugar, see if you can reduce sugar uh, and artificial colors and see if it makes a difference. With yeast, they will get worse before they get better. Be prepared for that. There's Vince. Hi, Vince. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Vince, as we mentioned before, is a licensed marriage and family therapist. He, as I said, he's a little bit of a unicorn that not only is he a licensed marriage and family therapist, but he is also someone who for many years worked as a behavior technician, worked in the field of ABA, doing one-to-one -one ABA. And you're still, sometimes you still supervise, isn't that right, Vince? I still supervise five cases, yeah. There you go. So you are uniquely qualified to address some of the concerns that our, that our parents have. We had talked a little bit the other day about the fact that it's a really stressful time for caregivers. They're hitting the wall. And I, I think they all thought, oh, we're just starting to get back to school. It's going to get better. And now schools are closing early. Schools are going back to distance learning. And I'm, I'm hearing from parents, Nancy, I don't know if you are too, that they're like, I just, I don't, I just don't know how much more of this I can do. Yeah. I think everybody is stretched really thin and people were expecting a bit of a break with Thanksgiving. And what we're finding is we have to make special arrangements for Thanksgiving that maybe our plans were thwarted of having family over because they're recommending now, of course, to just keep it your immediate family. And uh, as you say, going back to distance learning for some families that maybe had their kiddos 
off to school um, is another adjustment that might be having to be made. So Vince, are you finding a lot of stress in the families you work with? Yeah, I think in coming from all different angles, right? I mean, some of it's a school angle, some of it is the lack of, of you know, family gathering, family support, family, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, collaboration that people have around the holidays. You know, I had a really, really wonderful conversation with a parent yesterday in regards to, you know, the holidays are the time for family unity, family gatherings, family, you know, uh, get togethers. And how are they going to do that with all the mandates, regulations and so forth going across all the United States, right? Not, not only here in California, but pretty much all the states across the board and around the world. You know, so we talked about different ways of getting together, different ways of being safe, different ways of using protocols and PPEs, you know, the protective gear and stuff like that to make them feel comfortable. And I think every situation, there's a solution. There's a solution to easing anxiety, increasing family awareness and family communication, um, as well as, you know, making it so that we can, we can enjoy these modified holidays. It's hard. I mean, we had talked about this a little bit last week, Nancy and I, that um, I think our circumstances are different. I'm really used to spending Thanksgiving alone because my husband almost always has to work. This is actually the first time in, I think, maybe our marriage that he doesn't have to work on Thanksgiving Day. Um, so for me, you know, that's a, it's like I get to have my husband on Thanksgiving Day. But I think for a lot of people, it, it's the one holiday when they can get together with families, like maybe they can't um, during other holidays. So it's really rough, but we we decided that we were gonna do a thing, even though normally we say, you know, no devices at the table, we're bringing all of our devices to the table and my son will be on one device with one family, I'll be on another device with another family and then we'll be able to talk to everybody um, from our different devices. So at least it'll, feel like we're having dinner with them. I don't know. It might turn out to be just a nightmare of people talking over each other, but <laughs> we're going to make the attempt. Right. Uh, right. That's, that's great. Because it's those attempts. It's those, you know, those little moments, you know, this isn't going to be the same. We have to embrace that. We have to embrace. It's not going to be the, in, the same where you have to embrace that. It's not going to have the physical connection. We, we typically are used to. But it's the little moments of seeing grandma and grandpa, seeing aunts and uncles, seeing nieces and nephews and so forth, even if it's just for a brief 15, 20, 30 minutes that we're going to remember, right? Because we're still going to bond, we're still going to communicate, we're still going to have some type of a connection if it's possible, then if it's nothing completely you know, uh, 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 alone and not seeing the people we typically see. So I, I, I love the idea. I think I highly encourage it because now with most platforms, you can have multiple people at multiple times and everybody's seeing other, as we're doing right now, right? Everyone's seeing each other at the same time and we can all interact on our own, you know, our own device and everyone gets to see it. And again, if we go in with the interpretation that it's going to be the same or it's, it should equal the same, we're, we're, we're letting ourselves down. We have to go in no, you know, with the new expectation, just like you were just saying, Jen, let's see how it goes. It's, I mean, it, it's not gonna hurt either way. It's just gonna give us a whole new experience with everybody, which is gonna be funny. It's going to be silly because people aren't going to know what to do. You're going to get the typical, oh, the, you know, that I didn't unmute and, you know, all this stuff that we see. And that's just going to make a new memory. And we're going to, you know, and it'll be something that we remember and hopefully be able to cherish as, as we move on because it's anticipated. And again, nobody knows for sure, but it's anticipated that this is just a, this year, right? This is just the pandemic holiday of 2020, which is pretty much the entire year. And next year we'll be able to talk about, wasn't that funny last year when we were on Zoom and we all got to you know, see each other and wasn't that fun, you know, that kind of thing. So these are gonna make memories. And I think if we embrace that and cherish that, um, it gives us a better, you know, better attitude and maybe a little bit less anxiety heading into the holiday. I'm, I'm as concerned about, you know, I'm concerned for people and how they're feeling about the holidays, but I'm also, equally, if not more concerned about everyone as far as the distance learning, because, you know, 
I, I just, I've heard so many people who be a little bit judgy, but for a lot of parents, for a lot of caregivers, the period of time in which our children went to school was our break. That was the period of time in which we had, you know, we would work really hard in the IEP to make sure that our child was safe at school and taken care of in an, in an enriching environment. And that was like a full-time job getting that done. But while they were there, it was our opportunity to take a breath, take care of life, work, do, you know, do all the things that we needed to do. And sometimes that was a treadmill, but at least it was that respite. And having taken that off the table, some people have been off the table since the beginning, other people it was off the table and they just went back to school and now it's being taken off the table again. And I almost feel like for those people, it's that much harder. For those of us who've been home the whole time with our students, it's like, well, you know, we're still home. Uh, it's not great, but, you know, we didn't get our hopes up, get the kiddos off to school and now being told that it's being taken off the table. I'm worried for our caregivers about that, Vince. What advice do you have for them about being able to get a break, um, you know, just from, you know, we love our kids, but when they're constantly with us and on us, I'm hearing parents who are like, I would like five minutes to myself. Right. And, and I fully agree. I mean, I think school is, you know, for the mental well-being of not only the family, but the kids as well, school is good, right? They're around their peers or they're doing activities that they enjoy. And, and you know, a lot of times they're experiencing a lot of good, you know, new stuff. And that's where a lot of the, you know, generalization of their learning, you know, happens. And, and, and it's a good break for them as well, right? Because they too are getting, you um, that those socialization with other peers, the learning from different you know uh, modes of medium and so forth. But hammering your point home about the mental well-being of the families, a hundred percent agree. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's essential that we use the term physical distancing over social distancing, right? Because I think right now we need as much social interaction and social support as possible. Now, for those who can can get people or relatives or neighbors or babysitters to come and able, you know, respite workers and able to, to, to help watch their child and, and supervise their child while they're able to go to the grocery store or run errands or drive to the park and sit under a tree, right? And do some mindfulness to be able to bring, you know, some, 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 comfort and calming anxiety, calming their anxieties. Those are all very necessary. And I would definitely ask for the, the work with, with um, your professionals, your ABA professionals, or your, you know, uh, uh, other professionals on how to get some of that, but look for it, right? Look for, ask, you know, uh, uh, for those supports if they're available to you. Um, and the other thing, going back to what I was saying about social distancing, versus you know physical distancing this is not the time to not be social i get more concerned with people who actually are isolated and isolating by pure isolation meaning that they're not connected to anybody around them in any means um, this is a creating a lot of you know um, uh, uh, different emotions and different types of emotional issues that are coming up with families because they're not connected to their grandparents going back to what we're saying about the holiday table, not connecting with their resources, not connecting with their friends and coworkers, not connecting with their schoolmates and peers. That needs to happen in some shape or form, not only for you know the 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 growth and promotion of everybody's you know uh, uh, mental health and well being, but also because it keeps everybody connected and it gives us that to look forward to. So I know I just kind of threw a lot of stuff out there. Um, so there's a lot of different, you know, in, in specific um, situations that come up. And I think with the help of your professionals, there can be some solutions, you know, to, to help ease anxieties, ease um, some depressive or, you know, depression that people may be feeling by the isolation and help connect with, um, with loved ones and friends again. 
Right. You bring up a good point that a lot of people are isolated from coworkers. There are a lot of people that have had to quit their jobs during this time to stay yeah. home with their kids. So then we have the added stress of that for many families. And then there's the financial ramifications of that, the financial hardships that a lot of families are going through now. Right. right. Uh, yeah. And right now, I mean, and again, with not knowing if stimulus packages are coming through and unemployment, right. That's a financial burden that a lot of families are hiding, you know, because it's personal and that's right. stuff that we have to deal with. Um, but that's where that mindfulness and that time alone and that time to process and kind of plan is so necessary. Absolutely yeah. so much necessary. And that's where a lot of, from what I'm seeing, and I can only speak anecdotally based on my experience, a lot of families are still have a difficulty asking for help, yeah. asking for, um, you know, can someone watch their child for an hour or two? And I think we all have experienced that at some point in our lives, in our, in our child rearing. Um, but this is the time to embrace. This is the time that everyone's reaching out and doing what they can for one another because we're all experiencing, you know, uh, uh, terrible times in the time of the pandemic. Yeah. And I think for families, if for some reason you can't do that, I, I can think of some people that live, that are isolated and there is no one who can come and spend an hour. You know, I... I hear a lot of people being so concerned about how much screen time their kids are getting. Cause in the past, if somebody needed a break, we would say, put a Disney movie on, mm -hmm. like it's not going to, you know, harm them. But I know people are worried about the cumulative screen time, but we were just talking the other day with Dr. Grant Pichet that all screen time is not created equally. Right. That, that there are some games like camp discovery that the young kids can be playing on their iPad that they get very involved in. And they're having a, just a regular hoot nanny playing it, but they're really doing high quality ABA therapy while they're doing it. And that's ideal for when, you know, you can give them the iPad for that and be sitting far away in the room um, and doing, you know, something else, whether it's paint your toenails or doing a mindfulness exercise or yoga um, mm -hmm. or whatever. But I, you know, I also think that um, the Disney movies are not the worst thing for our kids that I actually think they're a really good thing. They teach really wonderful lessons and everything on PBS kids, right. and they have stuff up through, you know, for, for, um, young adults on PBS kids. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm more willing to have them do educational screen time, um, as a way for parents to give a break. What do you, you guys think about that? I think that's a great idea because they can't, parents can't be everywhere. So, um, you know, you got to cut yourself a break and maybe bend the rules a little bit, like you say, Shannon, with the screen time, as long as it has some redeeming value. I think um, a lot of parents need that. Interesting, while we were talking, I just got an email uh, that Wyatt's therapy hours have been reauthorized. We thought they might not be, and I was sweating bullets about that because when he's in ABA, it's a time for me to get other things done. And I know that that's a time for a lot of parents to get things done when their child is in their ABA therapy. But I think Shannon um, relying on like Disney kids, like you said, has some PBS kids, I mean, has some pretty good shows on that parents can take advantage of. And um, there's some other outlets as well um, and par I don't know, I watch a lot more things with Wyatt now, whereas, you know, we do it together and we use it as a, as a learning opportunity. You right. said you guys like Cobra Kai, right? Yeah. We like you that. You haven't started watching that. You like um, it? <laughs> okay. I gotta, I gotta watch that. But how do you feel about the screen time, Vince? For me, it's, I agree with everything you guys are saying. For me, it really comes down to scheduling, right? Scheduling your day so that it's predictable, not only for the child, but it's predictable for the families as well, because now you can organize when you're going to do things, when you're going to be able to, you know, to uh, finish a task or, or, you know, answer an email, return a phone call, pay a bill, you know, when we need to do, you know, our, our adulting, right? So when it's when you have a schedule, we now have less anxiety because we know exactly when we're going to do things, right? So we can say, okay, we're gonna 
get up, do the morning routine, and then have you watch PBS Kids for an hour. Now, as a parent, I know that's my time to go and talk to you know the doctor or you know talk to the supervisor or talk to um, you know uh, uh, my you know contractor that's redoing our patio or whatever, right? And so you're able now to predict how the day is going to go and how you're going to use that screen time, what screen time you can use, right? This is going to be a time we're going to watch it together, like Nancy was saying. Great interaction. But this is going to be a time where we're going to put on Camp, camp Discovery and have them do some learning and some gameplay along with a couple other learning games. Great, right? And then this is going to be the time where we do our activities. This is the time where they're going to be in ABA. This is the time where you know we'll go ahead and and uh, watch a movie, um, and now I can go ahead and do uh, uh, some other you know some other errands and things I need to do. So the idea for me is, is if the screen time is structured and scheduled, and again, all parents want our kids to watch things that are either educational, there's going to be learning, they're you know good for good you know good viewing, um, you know send good messages. And we can actually st structure that for them so that it gives us the predictability of our day. It gives the kids the predictability of their day. And we're able to still monitor and, and uh, time how much time they are um, having a screen. A viewer has written in, and I had to get a translation on it, but they had said uh, that uh, they recommended us to somebody and said they used to just be on Fridays, but now they're, I see they're doing videos more often. I just want to let everybody know that we're live now Monday to Friday. So, um, so great um, to have you here with us. Uh, and somebody said, uh, Michelle said, thank you so much for letting us know this information, Vince. It's a tough time, no matter how you slice it. And I think what's unique is um, that, oh, and somebody we love oh. just said, there are several online educational resources. Somebody that happens to be related to somebody who was on the show. That somebody Debbie Redmond. Somebody Redmond. Redmond. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and can I, that reminds me that I want to say something um, that we started a, a, a fundraiser for Autism Live last night on my Facebook uh, for Autism Care Today. And so uh, if you would like to make a donation, we're raising money for iPads for um, this holiday season for individuals on the autism spectrum. So it's on my Facebook if you wanna make a donation, anybody who's out there, if you have spare change, you wanna feel better. I know some of you already did. Um, and so Debbie says hi. Of course, we're talking about Vince's wife, Debbie thrilled uh, that she is here with us. And um, and she's a great resource for educational things. Uh, so Debbie, if you wanna hit us with anything specific, we're, we're, we're tuned in to what you're saying. Uh, and Traven wants us to know that we've raised $346 overnight for an iPad. So that's great. So that's, yeah. that's almost one iPad at that point. Um, but uh, we also like to load them with ProLoquo and things like that. So uh, if you got spare change, there is no donation of any size that is too small. We look forward to it. Uh, and Debbie and just can go to act-today.org as well to get more information on that. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, and thank you, Nancy. So, um, but so back to what we were talking about with families and how difficult this is. I think that one of the things that's really hard, somebody put it really well that I was listening to because they said, well, we're all in the same boat. And, and someone said, no, we're, we're all in the same ocean. Everybody's boat is different. And the pack of issues that people have is so unique in this, that one person might have, you know, a kiddo who's loving the isolation and they're worried about how am I going to get them out when this is over? Another person may have somebody who's got a kiddo who's like, I can't stand it. I'm, I'm trying to walk out the front door every day. So um, makes it really hard because we always we want to be mindful that we don't know what your specific issues are, but everybody's got it. As I talk to families, there's always something that's unique, Vince, that I think is making it specifically hard. Are you seeing that too, you guys? Yes. Yeah. I've seen some families that, like you say, their kiddos are really loving being at home, being on screen, 
not having to go out and interact. And that can have its own problems because then your kid could not want to reintegrate at some point. You know, we could get really used to this. Yeah, I, I'm going to be hard to get back out into society because I, I like being at home. Um, and, and I think we've done a fairly good job of um, at least once a month, we either host or go to a Zoom party with, with a bunch of people. And it's not always the same people. We've reconnected. I had two reunions, one that was a high school reunion and one that was a graduate school reunion over the summer and reconnected with people I hadn't talked to in years. Um, so I am I might be more social in this isolation than I normally am. Yeah, you've been really good, Shannon. And you've even, you've even arranged for Jim to have a birthday party online that's coming up. Well, Jim is, yeah. Jim is for Big Jim. He's, we offered for, for Jim and he was like, I don't want to do that. But we've been to many Zoom birthday parties. We've been to many events. Last night I was watching the Media Access Awards online, an event that I've always wanted to go to. And I, it's always at a time when I can't go, but there it was online and I got to be, you know, there front row center. It was amazing. Can I just tell you guys it was like so uplifting and amazing. It opened with a gentleman who was tap dancing, who has a, a literal peg leg. So wow. he, uh, and he was tap dancing and, and he was some kind of good. Um, and, and I would have missed that if it was just a live event that was being held at a hotel in Beverly Hills, because I find it hard to go to those things. So, yeah. you know, for me, I've sort of loved the access that we've had to things and, um, and that more people are more willing to do things online. Zoom is my friend. Um, uh, and, and my son has done some of those things as well with his friends. I will say that. You get a great party, um, a karaoke party, which yes. was just great fun, Shannon. I really enjoyed that. Right. Well, um, but you know, and everybody was like, how are you going to do that? And we were like, we don't know, but we're going to figure it out as we go. But, um, I, my husband has been doing plays online, Zoom plays. In fact, my husband and my son wrote one and I got to be in it. Um, and, and, right. So, so because we would have lost our minds if we hadn't. Um, so, but that was our unique thing to find what works for us. And I think it's not a one size fits all. Hey, I also want to bring up that Demi, Debbie mentioned there's a really great way for you to be able to donate to uh, Act Today on a regular basis. If you haven't already, if you go to smile.amazon.com, you can pick the charity of your choice. Of course, we're encouraging you to pick Autism Care Today. And then what happens is anytime you go to purchase something on Amazon, a little thing will pop up and say, hey, would you like to do this through Smile to redirect you? You purchase it. It's You're still buying it from Amazon, but it goes through the Smile app. And then Act Today or the other charity that you choose gets a percentage of that sale. I have to tell you, it's a very small percentage, but with everything that everybody's buying on Amazon, it adds up. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a great thing to do. So smile.amazon.com. And then you would pick um, Autism Care Today as your preferred charity. And then just make sure every time you use Amazon, that it'll, it gives you a pop-up. And you can click it, and it and um, it's super easy. Right. So, and the great thing about that is you spend no more, no money, no more money than you yeah. were buying your 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 things through Amazon. And Amazon's the one paying Act Today for the part of that sale, which is a great thing, a great thing yeah. for my Amazon, a great thing that they they do for for the nonprofits you know that are around. And I think it right now with the you know the pandemic everybody you know like we were saying earlier about how zoom has become our friend we've all become so much more technologically advanced now right because we've had to this we're doing a lot more online shopping so yep. the more online shopping we're doing the more we're able to raise funds to care for you know uh the ipads and families that need assistance and need equipment and things that that quite frankly are are life-saving at times it adds up. Um, Debbie just said that her sister donated almost two hundred dollars just with her Amazon purchases. So, like you say, yeah, that's a event. Yeah. That's a, I didn't realize how late it had gotten. Uh, it started late. 
But Vince, thank you so much. If people have questions and want to ask you, um, the best thing for them to email me and I forward them to you, what do you prefer? Yeah, that's fine. Or they can email me directly at, um, I, I know Trayvon has the email address, uh, v.redmond, R-E-D-M-O-N-D, at centerforautism.com. There you go. Thank you so much for always being Thank so you, willing. I hope that you and your family and your lovely wife and your girls have a wonderful Thanksgiving. You ladies as well, your families. Enjoy your Thanksgiving. Please, my love and peace to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, no, that. And um, for, for Nancy and I, I, I want to reiterate that next week we won't be here with a live show on Friday. It will be, You'll be seeing the uh, Autism Live Thanksgiving Marathon. There's Vince's email if you want that. Um, so Monday, live show, typical with Bonnie Yates. Tuesday, live show, not typical, toy review, toy mayhem with me, Dr. Doreen Grampy Shea and her three adult children. It, like, I guarantee it will be a laugh riot. I promise. Uh, it will be super duper fun. So, um, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we'll be doing the Autism Live Thanksgiving Marathon. A lot of the toy reviews that we've done in the past, plus fun interviews, um, keeping it fun. So tune in at any point. If you're needing us, you can still write in your questions on autism-live.com in the chat. Um, but uh, I hope that everybody has a great break, but we're there for you if you need us. Nancy, I want to thank you for always being so amazing. Thank you, Shannon. Great. I wish you a very happy Thanksgiving with Jim and Jem. And I, and I hope you'll be at Jim's Zoom birthday party. Yes, I'm planning on it. I'm planning okay. on it. And are, and are you ready to sing karaoke again? I, I think karaoke is a grand idea. Okay. Bring Wyatt. Uh, okay. That might be a really fun thing. All right. So uh, thanks to everybody. We'll be back on Monday. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me. And yourselves a hug from me. Bye-bye for now. Bye.